Welcome to the Mormon Exorcisms video. All right, it talks about evil spirits being cast out in Mormon scripture, in the DNC, in the Book of Mormon, and in the Bible, of course. Uh, this one is DNC 50, verse 2. It says, Behold, verily I say unto you that there are many spirits which are false spirits, which have gone forth in the earth, deceiving the world. All right, so these spirits, which are false spirits, uh, can people get be uh, possessed by them? Okay, well, it tells us in the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi 1131, And I beheld multitudes of people who were afflicted with devils and unclean spirits. The devils and the unclean spirits were cast out. So this idea of Mormon exorcism, it's, it's uh, all through Mormon scripture, the Book of Mormon and Bible especially. All right, and uh, one of the powers of Jesus, uh, of the Lord, uh, was that he could cast out devils. This is the Book of Mormon, Mosiah 3, 6. And he, the Lord, shall cast out devils or the evil spirits which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. Uh, Jesus could cast these out. All right, Book of Mormon, uh, Mormon 9, verse 24 it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Well, the early days of the church, they did this kind of stuff. What about now in 2021? Uh, do, any, do any of the general authorities cast out devils? Um, well, if they do, uh, it, is a, it is a sign uh, that they believe. So if they don't, is it a sign that they don't believe? All right, uh, Nephi and the Book of Mormon uh, cast out devils as well. This is uh, 3 Nephi 7, 19. And in the name of Jesus did he, Nephi, cast out devils and unclean spirits. So that's interesting. And, and this is how they, they do it in the Mormon church. They, they raise their arm to the square and they say, In the name of Jesus or by the power of Jesus Christ, I cast out uh, you evil spirits or devils. All right, so on the first day of the church, when it was first organized on April 6, uh, 1830, they actually cast out devils. This is from the Wentworth letter. Uh, you can find it on josephsmithpapers.org. Uh, see the picture above. So uh, it says, uh, on this founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, when it was first organized... Some few people were called and ordained by the spirit of revelation and prophecy and began to preach as the spirit gave them utterance. They saw visions and prophesied, devils were cast out, and the sick were healed by the laying on of hands. Well, does this kind of stuff happen anymore? All right, another revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith. This is on December 7, 1830. Uh, I believe it is now DNC 35. Uh, also, you can find this in the josephsmithpapers.org. See the picture above. Uh, says in this revelation, I am God and mine arm is not shortened and I will show miracles, signs and wonders unto all who believe in my name and whoso shall ask it in my name in faith, they shall cast out devils. All right, a little bit of information about Satan uh, from the Prophet Joseph Smith, February 16, 1832, vision slash revelation in Hiram, Ohio. It's in the handwriting of Joseph Smith and Frederick G. Williams. Uh, you can find it on josephsmithpapers.org uh, project, and I believe it is now DNC 76. So they say Satan is that old serpent, even the devil who rebelled against God, and sought to take the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Wherefore, Satan maketh war with the saints of God and encompass them round about. So Satan is at war with God and Christ and with the saints. Uh, Satan encompasseth uh, the saints round about. So they're, uh, they're always kind of lurking. These evil spirits that followed Satan and Satan himself they encompass the saints round about, and then we're going to get to other revelations where they actually possess the bodies of different saints. 
And here is a picture of Satan or Lucifer uh, that showed up in the LDS Temple Endowment. They believe that he's just basically a man. He is uh, one of the uh, children uh, of God, actually. <laughs> he's a child of God and actually the brother to Jesus in uh, Mormon theology. So this is kind of a representation uh, of what he looks like, uh, according to Mormons. Uh, it's kind of kind of blurry because you know, this it was all uh, a secret footage that somebody got. All right, uh, some more information about the powers of darkness and the adversary uh, in the Joseph Smith history. Uh, you can find this again josephsmithpapers.org. Uh, Joseph uh, says, it seems as though the adversary was aware at a very early period of my life that I was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of his Satan's kingdom. Else why should the powers of darkness combine against me? Why the opposition and the persecution that arose against me almost in my infancy? Uh, we won't get into all the reasons why he was persecuted. <laughs> Polygamy, uh, trying to establish the kingdom of God on earth through the Council of 50 and uh, breaking different laws. Uh, but it's interesting, he says, the powers of darkness combined against uh, Joseph Smith. We'll go over his first vision account where Satan or these evil spirits uh, kind of uh, attack Joseph Smith. Okay, first example here of Joseph Smith casting out Satan. This is in a letter from, from Joseph Smith to his brother Hiram Smith, March 3rd and 4th, 1831, josephsmithpapers.org. So Joseph says, This morning, after being called out of my bed in the night to go a small distance, I went and had an awful struggle with Satan. But being armed with the power of God, he was cast out. And this woman is clothed in her right mind. I guess he's talking about Mark uh, chapter 5, verse 15 in the Bible. The Lord worketh wonders in this land. So got up out of his bed, <laughs> went a small distance, struggled with Satan, but was able to cast him out. Through the power of God, I guess he's talking about uh, the Melchizedek priesthood, which I guess was restored by this time, although we really don't have a date for that. Uh, so interesting, an early account where there's going to be more. Okay, uh, the Brigham Young Apostolic Ordination Blessing. So when Brigham Young became an apostle, this was his ordination blessing. It was in Kirtland, February 14, 1835. Kirtland Council Minute Book, josephsmithpapers.org. So this one's regarding uh, Brigham Young. Uh, in his blessing, it says, The holy priesthood is confirmed upon thee, Brigham Young, that you may do wonders in the name of Jesus, that you may cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead and open the eyes of the blind. Well, when uh, new apostles get ordained in the modern day church in 2021, are they promised these same things? I kind of doubt it. Casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead, healing the blind. Uh, you don't see the, the modern day apostles doing this kind of stuff. All right, a little bit more information about the devil or Satan or Lucifer, <laughs> whatever you want to call him. This is by the prophet Joseph Smith again in a sermon. January 5th, 1841, reported by William Clayton, his secretary. Uh, josephsmithpapers.org again. Uh, all right, so a sermon by Joseph. He says, we came to the earth that we might have a body. The great principle of happiness consists in having a body. The devil has no body, and herein is his punishment. He, the devil, is pleased when he can obtain the tabernacle or body of a man being possessed by the devil or of an evil spirit. Uh, and when cast out by the Savior, he asked to go into the herd of swine, showing that he would prefer a swine's body to having none. And we're going to actually go through that whole story. That's the only part we're going to go through in the Bible about... Uh, 
people being possessed, their bodies being possessed by the devil or by evil spirits. Um, it, it's probably the best account in the Bible about this, but there's there's all kinds of different accounts in the Bible of uh, casting out the devil and uh, evil spirits. Okay, another sermon by the prophet Joseph Smith, May 21st, 1843, reported by Howard Corey, josephsmithpapers.org. All right, so this sermon again by Joseph. When, uh, when Lucifer was hurled from heaven, the decree was that he should not obtain a tabernacle or a body, nor those that were with him. third of the hosts of heaven of God's children were cast out. Uh, none of those were able to get bodies. Uh, but he was to go abroad upon the earth. Oft times he lays hold upon men, binds up their spirits, and enters their habitations, I guess, or their body. Laughs at the decree of God and rejoices in that he hath a house to dwell in. Uh, the bodies of men. By and by, he is expelled by authority, I guess the priesthood, and goes abroad mourning naked upon the earth. He's naked, I guess, because he has no body. All right, so a few more preliminary uh, statements by other leaders of the church, and then we're going to get into quite a few different uh, stories in detail of them being possessed, uh, how they acted <laughs> when these... Uh, Evil spirits and devils were inside them. And then uh, the Mormon ordinance, I guess you could call it, of casting out uh, these spirits. So the first first preliminary statement here is Apostle uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation, 1954. He says, the Lord cast them out into the earth. That was a third of the hosts of heaven. If you figure there's been about 100 billion people live on the earth up until now take a third of a hundred billion and those are all the ones that got cast out uh, and followed Satan and had no bodies and basically are sons of perdition and went to hell a third of God's children which is pretty shocking uh, they were cast out uh, where they became the tempters of mankind so they came here to earth all those spirits a third of the hosts of heaven came to tempt mankind uh, at times, these fallen spirits steal possession of the bodies of men and women, overpowering the spirit who has a rightful ownership. So that kind of sucks. <laughs> the evil spirit overpowers your own spirit and takes control of your body. Okay, another statement by the Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith. Uh, this is from his book, uh, Man, His Origin and Destiny, 1954. He says, under some conditions, Satan has bound the bodies of individuals by his power, bound their bodies, tied them up. We have the evidence of such being true in this dispensation in which we now live. Satan bounding, controlling, I guess, tying up the bodies of individuals. Okay, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith continues in the same source. There are scores of cases fully attested in our own day of demon influence and possession, cases which were not caused by derangement of the mind, they weren't mentally ill, but by actual overpowering of the individual and taking possession of his body. Scores of cases fully attested to in 1954 of demon influence and possession. And we're going to go over some of the most interesting, detailed, and shocking cases in this video. It's going to be a pretty long video. All right. A couple of statements here. Uh, preliminary statements by Bruce R. McConkie in his famous book, at least amongst the Mormons, Mormon Doctrine, 1958, first edition. Uh, under the article uh, under uh, devils, plural devils, uh, McConkie says, they were cast down to earth and have been forever denied physical bodies. That is the third of the hosts of heaven. Uh, this is a fact which causes them to seek habitation in the bodies of other persons. 
<clears throat> so they don't have their own bodies, these billions of people, it, which causes them to seek habitation in the bodies of other persons. All right, so what can we do about these poor, afflicted people who are possessed by Satan or evil spirits or by devils? McConkie tells us, same source, by the power of faith and the authority of the priesthood, devils are frequently cast out of such afflicted persons. All right, Bruce R. McConkie again in a different book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, Volume 2, 1971. McConkie says, How literal a thing it is to be possessed by evil spirits. It is a literal thing. This is something that actually happens. Devils are spirit men and women. So you can be possessed by a woman spirit as well. They have power to enter and control the bodies of mortals. I thought we had free agency and free will. Why did God allow these evil spirits to be able to enter our bodies and control our bodies? Doesn't that kind of take away our uh, free agency? Okay, Bruce R. McConkie again, same source, 1971. He says, by the power of the priesthood, but not through incantations or exorcism, uh, these evil spirits may be cast out of their illegally inhabited tenements or bodies. Uh, McConkie doesn't want to call it an exorcism. That's kind of a Catholic term. In early Catholicism, there are, they did a lot of exorcisms. Not, I don't think they do much anymore. Uh, but it's basically the same thing. You're casting out the devil. You're casting out evil spirits. Mormons uh, just do their ordinance uh, a little different than the Catholics do. Uh, Mormons, I get, or at least McConkie doesn't like to call it exorcism. That is kind of the scholarly term for it, though. Uh, it, Mormons just do it, the ordinance, a little different uh, than the Catholics. Okay, Encyclopedia of Mormonism uh, talks about this a little bit. This article, which is also called Devils, is by BYU professor Chauncey C. Riddle in 1992. Uh, he says, It is Satan's business to dwell in and with all individuals who do not have the Holy Spirit with them. Wow. So <laughs> if you have the Holy Spirit with you, does that mean the devil or Satan uh, or evil spirits cannot get into your body? It is Satan's business to dwell in and with all individuals who do not have the Holy Spirit with them. That's how he makes it sound, right? Like, if you, have, if you are confirmed with the gift of the Holy Ghost, they can't get into you. But uh, we're going to see plenty of cases in this uh, video where the saints are good saints. They've been baptized. They've had the Holy Ghost conferred upon them, and they, they still get possessed by these evil spirits. Riddle says, sometimes uh, even gaining total possession of a person's body. Sometimes they can gain total possession of your body. So that he or she loses agency for a time. Doesn't that go against Heavenly Father's plan? Taking away our free agency? All right, so let's get into the story in the Bible of the evil spirits being cast out into the swine or the pigs. Uh, the most detailed account is in Mark chapter 5. Uh, this uh, information here is verses 1 and 2. I'm going to use the NIV version of the Bible, New International Version. Easier to understand, follow, follow along in the story, and it's a more accurate translation. I won't go into all the reasons why. It just is. Research it for yourself. Mormon Church needs to switch from the KJV. So here in Mark chapter 5, it says, uh, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. All right, so you kind of see this map here of where this took place. Uh, near Gadara, the drowning of the pigs uh, near the Sea of Galilee. All right, the story continues here, Mark chapter 5. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart 
and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Sounds like kind of a guy uh, suffering from mental illness. Okay, uh, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Okay, the story continues. Uh, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. So he's casting that evil spirit out of him. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Uh, many of these evil spirits, I guess. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. I guess not to send the evil spirits out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us amongst the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he, Jesus, gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. He gave them permission, and they came out and went into the pigs, about 2,000 of them, and were drowned. Um, kind of a waste of food, huh, unless they're able to get them out of the lake. And uh, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to see Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. Apparently 2,000. <laughs> uh, he was sitting there dressed and in his right mind. He wasn't acting mentally ill anymore, I guess. Uh, and they were afraid. Okay, uh, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. I guess was he, they were scared of him, I guess. Okay, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed uh, begged to go with him. Okay, uh, Jesus did not let him uh, get on the boat, I guess, uh, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. All right, uh, so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis or the 10 cities around about uh, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Uh, so here's a map uh, above here of the Decapolis. Not sure exactly which of these ten cities are part of it, but it's it's in this area. All right, so that's the story of the evil spirits being cast into the herd of swine. That's all we're, all we're going to really go over in the Bible. There's plenty of other cases of uh, casting out evil spirits in the Bible. That's this kind of uh, one of the more famous ones. Let's get now to Joseph Smith's first vision. Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith History 1, verse 15. Uh, after I, Joseph Smith, had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. All right, so uh, what happened next in the first vision? Something dark and scary. Uh, Joseph Smith said that, I, that he had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. So there's this evil power, this evil influence that had an astonishing influence over Joseph Smith that bound his tongue, taking away his free agency there so he can't talk. Uh, so, you know, this would be scary, right?
All right, so Joseph Smith continues. A thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. But exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. So I guess we can assume it's Satan. Uh, just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages. Or if you read the, uh, uh, the fir earliest <laughs> edition of the first vision, uh, Joseph Smith in his own handwriting uh, says that he only saw one, uh, the Lord. All right, so let's get to some uh, stories of actual Mormon exorcisms. Uh, this is a short account from the journals of William E. McClellan, April 2nd, 1833, diary entry. Uh, he says, a young lady in the neighborhood who was afflicted with an evil spirit, even to fits and convulsions, sent for us to go and pray for her, and we went. We prayed with them, <clears throat> we prayed with them and laid our hands on her. Hopefully, I, I guess, to uh, uh, cast out this uh, evil spirit. Uh, it's interesting to note fits and convulsions are um, symptoms. Symptoms, is that right? <laughs> uh, fits and convulsions are symptoms of seizures or epilepsy. So uh, some of these early cases of this demon possession kind of stuff could uh, be people having seizures or uh, epilepsy. All right, another uh, longer account. This is from the autobiography of Nancy Naomi Alexander Tracy. Typescript is in the Harold B. Lee Library at BYU. This occurred in 1834. <clears throat> it was a young lady named uh, Emily Fuller. She had joined the church and was suddenly taken ill and went into convulsions. She got worse, uh, she grew worse, and her frame was racked with cramping. So again, maybe seizures or uh, epilepsy. All right, the account uh, continues. It took three or four of us to keep her on the bed. The elders were away quite a distance, filling appointments. My husband was at home, but he only held the office of a deacon, the ironic priesthood. So consequently, he could not administer the ordinance of the laying on of hands to rebuke the destroyer. Didn't have a high enough priesthood calling, I guess. Need the Melchizedek priesthood, I'm assuming. Uh, and they would do it by laying on of hands. Other times, they'll raise their arm to the square and say, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, I cast you out. Okay, the story continues. Autobiography of Nancy Naomi Alexander Tracy. But everything was done that could be, but nothing relieved her. It seemed that the evil spirits were bound to destroy her. At last my husband got on a horse and rode 14 miles and brought Elder Dusher to administer to her. Maybe he had the Melchizedek priesthood. She was in great agony when he came in. Okay, uh, he knelt down and prayed mightily for strength and power that he might rebuke the destroyer and bid him depart. He arose and went to the bedside, laid his hands upon her head, and clothed with the authority and power of the priesthood, he rebuked the destroyer and told her to be made whole and arise from her bed. All right, so she did arise from the bed and called for water to wash and the comb to comb her hair, although she was very weak, for she had been in this state for 24 hours. Time can never erase this from my memory, for I was an eyewitness of the whole thing, 
and it was the power of God that raised her up. Okay, another account uh, from the life of Moroni uh, Geber. Geber? Not sure how you say that. I don't have a date for this. Uh, during the early days of the church, evil spirits were prevalent. Elder Cheney and I, Moroni, uh, came to Sister Julie Willits one day when she was very sick. All right. Uh, she asked us to administer to her. I anointed and Elder Cheney sealed the anointing. In doing so, he rebuked the evil spirit and commanded it to stay rebuked. Okay. At the moment that Elder Cheney rebuked the evil spirit, it attacked him. The evil spirit attacked him. Cheney said that I could hardly get out of the house. At the door, it was so powerful that it crushed me to the earth. I had to crawl part of the way out of here. I tried to pray, but in that attempt, I was choked almost to death. <laughs> so this is really scary stuff. Tell this to children. They'll be terrified. This evil spirit crushed him to the earth and choked him almost to death. All right, uh, the story of Apostle David W. Patton uh, running into Bigfoot. <laughs> this story uh, was popularized in Spencer W. Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. The original source for it is Lycurgus A. Wilson, The Life of David W. Patton, 1900. <clears throat> so we go to this early uh, book, life of David W. Patton to get the full story here of what happened. But there is uh, an exorcism or a casting out here of Bigfoot. All right. So in the spring of 1836, or it could be September 1835, I saw both dates uh, here in the book. So I'm not sure which one it is. Around 1835 or 1836, Apostle David W. Patton uh, had one of the most remarkable experiences of his life. He was riding home in the evening. He suddenly became aware that a person on foot by his side was keeping pace with the mule on which he rode. So picture to buy we have a, a guy riding a mule in the 19th century. All right, so we get uh, a lot of this information from a letter, I guess. It was from Abraham O. Smoot to the president and prophet Joseph F. Smith. Uh, so it says, The family immediately observed that his David W. Patton's countenance was quite changed. Uh, my Abraham O. Smoot's mother, having first noticed his changed appearance, uh, said, Brother Patton, are you sick? All right, same source here. Uh, David replied that he was not, he was not sick, I guess, but had just met with a very remarkable personage who had represented himself as being Cain, who murdered his brother Abel. All right, uh, in the words of David, as recalled by Abraham, O Smoot, a very strange personage walked along beside me for about two miles. His head was about even with my shoulders as I sat in my saddle. So pretty tall guy. His head was even with his shoulders just walking along his mule. Uh, this very strange personage, which um, later people would interpret as being Bigfoot. <laughs> All right, the story continues. Uh, he, Bigfoot, wore no clothing, but was covered with hair. Kind of like a gorilla, right? His skin was very dark. I asked him where he dwelt, and he replied that he had no home. He said he was a very miserable creature, uh, that he had earnestly sought death, but that he could not die. And his mission was to destroy the souls of men. So here, here's the idea where he's, a, he's an evil, uh, mean guy. All right, so here is the exorcism or the rebuking of uh, Cain, <laughs> who has been identified as Bigfoot. About the time that he expressed himself thus, I rebuked him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by virtue of the holy priesthood and commanded him to go hence, and he immediately departed out of my sight. 
So there it is, the, the exorcism of Bigfooter or Kane. Pictured above, we have kind of a funny <laughs> group here, the LDS Boy Scouts, uh, kind of looking at this uh, tall, uh, black, hairy creature, which it was Kane or Bigfoot, and it says, uh, when you can rebuke Kane with your priesthood power, you will earn your Bigfoot merit badge. All right, we have another good account here from the Apostle Parley P. Pratt in his autobiography, which came out in 1874. When Parley P. Pratt was on a mission to Toronto, Canada in 1836, the following occurred. A young woman named Whitney was taken down very suddenly with a strange affliction. A lot of these stories do uh, occur or appear when people are on their missions when you're really focused on the work of the Lord and your whole life is revolving around uh, the teachings of the church and in preaching the gospel, this seems to be a time when um, evil spirits uh, attack. Okay, so the apostle Parley P. Pratt continues, uh, she would be prostrated by some power invisible to those around her, basically laid flat on the bed or, or on the ground. And in an agony of distress indescribable, she would be drawn and twisted in every limb and joint. Kind of sounds like a seizure. And would almost, in fact, be pulled out of joint. Okay, sometimes when thrown onto the bed, and while four or five stout men were endeavoring to hold her, she would be so drawn out of all shape as to only touch the bed with her heels and the back part of her head. Kind of as pictured above, an arch on the heels and on the back of your head. This is uh, definitely how it would appear if someone, someone was having a seizure. Okay, uh, she would be bruised, cramped, and pinched while she would groan and scream and froth at the mouth, etc., she often cried out that she could see two devils in human form who were thus operating upon her and that she could hear them talk. All right, so the frothing at the mouth again, that, that's another uh, sign of seizure uh, as pictured above. All right, Pratt continues, uh, but as the bystanders could not see them, the two devils, I guess, but only see the effects they did not know what to think or how to understand. Uh, she would have one of these spells once in about 24 hours. All right, uh, the story continues. Uh, Whitney, who was the possessed lady, came to see Parley P. Pratt at a meeting. Parley ceased to preach and stepping to her in the presence of the whole meeting, I laid my hands upon her and said, Sister, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven. Thy faith hath made thee whole, and in, the, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke the devils and unclean spirits, and command them to trouble thee no more. Uh, she returned home well, went about her housekeeping, and remained well from that time forth. Kind of doubt that. <laughs> Seizures would probably reoccur. All right, uh, the story of when some of the apostles of the LDS Church were on missions to England. Uh, this is the, one of the more well-known stories of, the, of casting out devils, being possessed by evil spirits. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of information about these accounts, and I have uh, accounts from several different sources. The main one here that we're going to start with is from the apostle Heber C. Kimball, on his mission to England, July 30, July 30, 1837 is when this occurred, and this shows up in the book by Orson F. Whitney, Life of Heber C. Kimball, which came out in 1888. Uh, so it says, by this time, the adversary of souls began to rage, and he felt determined to destroy us before we had fully established the kingdom of God in that land, England. And the next morning, I witnessed a scene of satanic power and influence, which I shall never forget. All right, the story from Apostle Heber C. Kimball here, one account. He talks about this elder uh, Isaac Russell, 
who came up to where Elder Orson Hyde and myself were sleeping and called out, I want you to get up and pray for me that I may be delivered from the evil spirits that are tormenting me to such a degree that I feel that I cannot live long unless I obtain relief. And uh, pictured above, we have a picture of uh, Elder Isaac Russell. Okay, Elder Hyde and I, Heber C. Kimball, threw Isaac Russell's feet out and sat him up in the bed, and we laid hands on him, I being the mouth, and prayed that the Lord would have mercy on him, and we rebuked the devil. Okay, Heber continues here, same account. While thus engaged, I was struck with a great force by some invisible power and fell senseless on the floor. Sometimes they call that pro being prost prostrate, right? Is that how you say it? <laughs> Prostrated. The first thing I recollected was being supported by elders Hyde and Richards who were praying for me. All right, Heber continues. He is an apostle. Uh, elders Hyde and Richards then assisted me to get on the bed, but my agony was so great that I could not endure it. And I arose, bowed my knees, and prayed. I then arose and sat up on the bed when a vision was opened to our minds. What kind of a vision was this? Is it something they actually saw with their physical eyes? Is it something they saw with their spiritual eyes in their mind? He says, a vision was opened up to our minds. It's probably talking about second sight or a, a spiritual vision. All right, the story continues. Uh, we would distinctly see the evil spirits who foamed and gnashed their teeth at us. We gazed upon them about an hour and a half. Space appeared before us, and we saw the devils coming in legions, that is, many with their leaders who came within a few feet of us. All right. Uh, the evil spirits came towards us like armies rushing to battle. They appeared to be men of full stature, possessing every form and feature of men in the flesh who were angry and desperate. That's what Mormons believe these evil spirits look like. They're just men or women, I guess, without bodies. And I shall never forget the vindictive malignity depicted on their countenances as they looked me in the eye. Okay, Heber continues. On his mission to England, 1837. Uh, any attempt to paint the scene which then presented itself or portray their malice and enmity would be vain. I perspired exceedingly, my clothes becoming as wet as if I had been taken out of the river. All right. I, Heber, felt excessive pain and was in the greatest distress for some time. I cannot even look back on the scene without feelings of horror. Yet by it I learned the power of the adversary, his enmity against the servants of God, and got some understanding of the invisible world. All right, uh, we distinctly heard the spirits talk and express their wrath and hellish designs against us. However, the Lord delivered us from them and blessed us exceedingly that day. All right, we next have the account of Apostle Orson Hyde, who was at this scene. He was also on his mission to England in 1837. It's in the same source here. Orson F. Whitney, Life of Heber C. Kimball, 1888. So Orson Hyde says, Every circumstance that occurred at that scene of devils is just as fresh in my recollection at this moment as it was at the moment of its occurrence and will ever remain so. So it definitely made an impression. Okay, so the Apostle Orson Hyde continues the account. Uh, after Heber C. Kimball was overcome by them, the evil spirits, and had fallen, their awful rush upon me with knives, threats, imprecations or spoken curses, and hellish grins amply convinced me that they were no friends of mine. <laughs> so 
I don't know if, if Orson Knight is saying he's seeing this with his spiritual eyes, probably. He sees them rushing upon him with knives. Are they real knives? They're going to cut their necks. It doesn't sound like it, but he sees them with knives, threats, imprecations, or spoken curses, and hellish grins. So it's, it's really frightening stuff. All right. Apostle Orson Hyde continues. Uh, while Heber C. Kimball was apparently senseless and lifeless on the floor and upon the bed, I stood between you and the devils and fought them and contended with them face to face. So he's kind of uh, protecting Heber C. Kimball here, <laughs> fighting the devils. Uh, how do you fight somebody that doesn't have a body, though? <laughs> uh, it's kind of weird. Until they began to diminish in number and to retreat from the room. All right. Uh, the last imp, uh, which is a small mischievous devil, the last imp that left turned around to me as he was going out and said as if to apologize and appease my determined opposition to them, I never said anything against you. <laughs> So this, this last imp, this small mischievous devil, uh, on his way out, I guess, said, I never said anything against you. Hmm, why did he say that? Okay, Orson continues here, same uh, source. I replied to him thus, it matters not to me whether you have or have not. You are a liar from the beginning. In the name of Jesus Christ, depart. And he immediately left and the room was clear. Uh, that closed the scene of devils for that time. All right. Uh, same uh, scene here from a different source. This is Joseph Fielding's diary, August 8, 1837. Goes into a lot of detail about what was happening here with Brother Isaac Russell. Uh, of course, Joseph Fielding is, is on his mission to England, just like uh, Heber and Orson were. This is not the Joseph Fielding Smith that you're probably uh, more familiar with, or it's not, it's not Joseph F. Smith. I think, I think it's some different guy uh, who was on his mission. I don't think he ever became a, a general authority. Uh, so he says, Brother Russell has been for a long time grievously afflicted by the devil or by evil spirits, perhaps two or three years. I was well acquainted with his state. He was so afflicted at one time that he was not fit to be left alone. All right, so the account uh, from Joseph Fielding's diary, 1837. So this is happening uh, uh, at the same time, I guess, right, right along the same time. All right, so he says, He said that four or more devils were in him, and imagine that by hanging down his head, he should void them. See picture above. He would sit on a chair and put his hands under his feet and his head as low as he could get it. Sounds like somebody may be suffering from uh, mental illness. Okay, Joseph Fielding continues in his diary, 1837. Uh, this we believe to be a stratagem of the devil, if possible, to deprive him of his senses. We therefore determine not to let him act thus. He's putting his head way down low. He then endeavored to get away from us. Okay. I was twice called to leave my work and seek him in the woods. And he was much grieved at my requiring him to come home. It seemed plain to me that the devil designed to destroy him if possible. But he did not still believe that he was possessed with devils. Okay, so Joseph Fielding continues here in his diary. Uh, he was spiritual and quite rational. I guess we're still talking about uh, Isaac Russell. We know of no precedent for such a case. His family were in great trouble. His wife was near being confined. And he himself attending to no business and in such a state that his mother at one time proposed putting on him a straight waistcoat as it was called what is a straight waistcoat well that's a 19th century term for straight jacket uh <laughs> like a straight jacket but uh longer 
kind of goes uh, down past the waist, I guess. Kind of as, as pictured above here. So this is a guy that doesn't seem to be well in his mind. He, he seems to be uh, suffering from some sort of a mental illness. And um, uh, what it says, what his wife, too, was near being confined. So maybe his wife was having some mental illness as well. Okay, the account uh, continues. Uh, this we were unwilling to do. We spent much time in prayer with him, but to no purpose. He would often say that by such a time, perhaps a few hours, he should die. He would make prophecies, Isaac Russell here, <laughs> make prophecies that in a few hours, you know, I'm going to be dead. Uh, when it failed, he would say that the Lord had just granted him a little longer time, but would soon fix another time. But he always found some reason for his words failing. So this, this guy doesn't sound like he's well. We did all that we could to raise him out of his dejected state of mind. He went to work, but was still much afflicted. He was, however, the first in our neighborhood to be baptized into the Church of Latter-day Saints. So, uh, not the greatest uh, <laughs> convert here, causing uh, a, a lot of trouble for uh, members of the Church and, and these apostles. All right, the account uh, continues. Soon after this, he was ordained an elder being still afflicted in his body. As he said, the evil spirits would sometimes press him, sometimes as if they would scratch him, etc. Again, I ask the question, how does a, an evil spirit uh, with no body, how do they scratch you? <laughs> All right. In the night, uh, they, the spirits, would, while in his sleep, present to his mind various figures, sometimes to tempt him, sometimes to alarm him, and sometimes as a combatant. He got but little sleep and became bowed down, or bowed down. All right, early on Sunday morning by daylight, having been much, having been much troubled through the night, he rose and went up to Elder Kimball's and Hyde to get them to pray with him. All right, Brother Hyde got up, and they both laid their hands on him and began to rebuke the spirits. Uh, while Heber C. Kimball was praying, his speech began to falter, and he was thrown down on the floor and was in great agony, so that the sweat ran, da so that the sweat ran down his face. All right, uh, all in an instant, Isaac Russell said, that it, that it appeared as if every part of his body was distorted, etc., to the utmost. It would have deprived him, he thought, of life in a few minutes. But Brother Hyde and Kimball lifted him onto the bed, laid their hands on him, and rebuked the evil spirits. All right, uh, but he did not fully recover from its effects for a day or two. Brother Hyde also received a severe gripe on one thigh. They could hear a sound from them, that is, from the evil spirits, like the grating of teeth, quite plainly. All right. Uh, all of this appeared to be to prevent Brother Russell from preaching according to appointment that day in the marketplace. This design, however, was frustrated Brother Russell preached, and Brother Goodson bore testimony after him. All right. Uh, on Sunday night, uh, Brother Russell was again greatly troubled in the same manner. So this was a reoccurring uh, thing. And got Brother Richards, who slept with him, to go up to Brother Kimball and Hyde and request them to come down to his relief. All right, uh, about this time, as Brother Hyde declared, as he and Brother Kimball were lying in bed, himself being awake, he saw, as it were, a host of those foul spirits, not on the floor, but as it were, in the midst of the room, in various shapes and forms. Some of them were like naked women, misshapen and ugly, 
Some were like cats with half a head, etc. And others half of one creature, half of one creature and half of another. The most miserable and disgusting appearances that one could possibly imagine. All right, story continues. Uh, they, however, kept their distance, but turned their heads towards Brother Hyde. One was looking at him and said distinctly, but with a murmuring tone, a slowly uh, demure, that I never spoke against you. Supposedly one of the evil spirits uh, said that to uh, Brother Orson Hyde, and, and Hyde had also mentioned that. All right, Joseph Fielding continues. Uh, he said that there seemed to be a legion or a great number of these evil spirits. He was alarmed, but very much disgusted. He could scarcely bear to speak of them. The confusion and disorder of these creatures identifies them with the spirit uh, that inspired the famous French prophets. And uh, I don't know much about them. <laughs> Okay, uh, they have not properly understood the operation of the Spirit of God. In many cases, it is plain that individuals have been inspired, and it was not known whether it was a good or an evil spirit. But since the Lord has again bestowed on men the gift of the Holy Ghost, they may clearly discern between the two spirits. Okay, upon the whole we got considerable instructions from the maneuvers of the devil. They learned about him. The spirit of the devil produces confusion, disorder, and misery. The spirit of God produces calmness, order, and happiness. If we never before knew that there were evil spirits, we did now. All right, so that's the end of our account from Joseph Fielding's diary. We're now gonna go uh, to some speeches this one by the Apostle and in the First Presidency, Heber C. Kimball, Journal of Discourses, March 2nd, 1856. Uh, so a number of years later that um, this supposedly occurred, like I said, in uh, 1837. We're now in 1856. Uh, but they're going to talk about it. Heber's going to talk about it. I believe Brigham Young is going to talk about it. And so we get uh, some more information here. Uh, the night previous to my going forward to baptize Brother Watt and eight others, I had a vision of the infernal world. So that's probably a vision in his mind's eye. All right, so Heber uh, continues. I saw legions or a great number of wicked spirits that night, as plain as I now see you. And they came as near to me as you now are and company after company of them rush towards me. All right, he continues. Uh, Brother Hyde and Brother Richards also saw them. It was near the break of day, and I looked upon them as I now look upon you. He's, he's speaking to the saints in Utah. Uh, they came when I was laying hands upon Brother Isaac Russell. All right, uh, the wicked spirits got him to the door of the room I did not see them until after that took place, and soon afterwards I lay prostrate upon the gr upon the floor. That was in England. They struggled and exerted all their power and influence. I was shown those spirits as plainly as ever I saw anything. I was thinking that those spirits were just as much on hand to perplex this people as they were on hand there. So. A lot of evil spirits on hand in, in the Utah Territory uh, to perplex people, just as they were in England. I saw their hands, their eyes, and every feature of their faces, the hair on their heads and their ears. In short, they had full-formed bodies. Okay, uh, the evil spirits can rush as an army going to battle. For the evil spirits came upon me and Brother Hyde in that way. There is one circumstance in the visit of those evil spirits that I would not tell if Brother Hyde had not often told it himself. All right. Uh, they spoke and said to Brother Hyde, we have nothing against you. Uh, no, but I, Heber, was the lad that they were after. I mention this to show that the devil is an enemy to me. So... 
they're more after Heber than they were Hyde, and he, he kind of wears this as a badge of honor, right? Uh, the devil was a special enemy to Heber, probably because Heber had so much uh, spiritual power, right? All right, Heber continues. Same speech here, March 2nd, 1856. The devil is also an enemy to Brother Brigham Young, who was the prophet at this time, to the Twelve, and to every righteous man. When Brother Benson goes to the old country or England, he will find hosts of evil spirits, and he will know and he will know more about the devil than he ever did before. Okay, Heber continues here. Uh, the spirits of the wicked who have died for thousands of years past are at war with the saints of God upon the earth. Do I ever pray that I may see them again? No, I do not. So all the wicked spirits, the wicked people who have died for thousands of years, uh, they're still hanging around here on the earth uh, as spirits, uh, tempting us, possessing us, controlling us. Okay, Heber uh, continues. The next morning I was so weak that I could scarcely stand. So great was the effect that those spirits had upon me. I wrote a few words to my wife about the matter, and Brother Joseph Smith called upon her for the letter and said, this is what Joseph said, it was a choice jewel and a testimony that the gospel was planted in a strange land. When I returned home, I called upon Brother Joseph Smith and we walked down by the bank of the river. He there told me what contest that he had had with the devil. All right, Joseph Smith told me that he had had contests with the devil face to face. He also told me how he was handled and afflicted by the devil. And he said that he had known circumstances where Elder Rigdon was pulled out of bed three times in one night. I talked about that circumstance with uh, Sidney Rigdon in a different video. Uh, it may not have been the devil. It may, it may have been uh, real people. Okay. Uh, after all this, some persons will say to me that there are no evil spirits. I tell you they are thicker than the Mormons are in this country. So they're thick uh, in the uh, Utah Territory. Uh, but the Lord has said that there are more for us than there can be against us. <clears throat> uh, more spirits are for the Mormons than there are against the Mormons. So, okay, but evil spirits are very thick amongst the Mormons there in uh, the Utah Territory. This is in 1856. All right, so a few months later, the prophet uh, Brigham Young also talked about this incident that happened in England with uh, Kimball and Hyde. Happened in Preston, England, uh, to be precise. This is Brigham Young speaking in 1856, June uh, 22. He says, if the Lord would permit it, and it was his will that it should be done, you could see the spirits that have departed from this world as plainly as you now see bodies with your natural eyes, as plainly as brothers Kimball and Hyde saw those wicked disembodied spirits in Preston, England. All right, Prophet Brigham Young continues. Uh, they saw devils there as we see one another. They could hear them speak and knew what they said. Could they hear them with a natural ear? No. Did they see those wicked spirits with their natural eyes? No. So it was their spiritual ears, uh, spiritual eyes. And really this is what happened with the uh, eight and three witnesses uh, to the Book of Mormon plates. Uh, there's plenty of accounts that show they did not see them with their natural uh, eyes. Uh, they saw them uh, with their spiritual eyes. And uh, this is another example of that uh, going on here with these evil spirits, according to Brigham Young. And apparently it talks about the natural eye versus the spiritual eye in uh, 2 Kings 6.15 uh, in the Old Testament. Okay, Brigham Young continues. Uh, they could not see them the next morning when they were not in the spirit, neither could they see them the day before, nor at any other time. Their spiritual eyes were touched by the power of the Almighty. So God can help you to see things in your mind's eye uh, with your spiritual eyes as looking through a mountain, they would sometimes say.
Okay, Brigham Young continues. They said that they looked through their natural eyes, and I suppose they did. Brother Kimball saw them, but I know not whether his natural eyes were open at the time or not. So maybe he's just kind of laying down and his eyes are closed, but he can still see. Brother Kimball said that he lay upon the floor part of the time, and I presume that his eyes were shut. But he saw them, as also did Brother Hyde, and they heard them speak. All right. Uh, we may inquire where the spirits dwell that the devil has power over. They dwell anywhere in Preston, England, as well as in any other uh, places in England. Do they dwell anywhere else? Yes, on this continent. It is full of them. So... Uh, in the Americas. The Americas are full of these evil spirits. All right, so how many of these spirits are in North America? Well, Brigham Young tells us, he says, if you could see and would walk over many parts of North America, you would see millions on millions of spirits of those who have been slain upon this continent. So he's probably thinking of uh, Nephites and Lamanites, right? Millions of those spirits still lingering around would you see the spirits of those who were as good in the flesh as they knew how to be uh yes okay he uh continues here would you see the spirits of the wicked yes could you see the spirits of devils yes and that is all there is of them uh, they have been deprived of bodies and that constitutes their curse that is to say speaking after the manner of men you shall be wanderers on the earth. You have got to live out of doors all the time that you live. Okay, uh, that is the situation of the spirits that were sent to the earth when the revolt took place in heaven. When Lucifer, the son of the morning, was cast out, where did he go? He came here to the earth, and one-third part of the spirits in heaven came with him. So... If there was 100 billion people that have ever lived, maybe uh, 30 billion. <laughs> uh, these are the one-third part of the sp spirits of heaven and the, uh, the evil spirits. Okay, Prophet Brigham Young continues here. June 22, 1856, speaking to the church. The evil spirits are always trying to get possession of the bodies of human beings. We read of a man's being possessed of a legion, that is many, and Mary Magdalene had seven of these evil spirits, apparently. You may now see people with legions of evil spirits in and around them. There are men who walk our streets that have more than a hundred devils in them and round about them, prompting them to all manner of evil. That's pretty terrifying, you know, <laughs> to hear this kind of stuff uh, being spoken of in, in uh, general conference, basically, uh, that some of the people walking around have a hundred devils in them and round about them. Okay, Brigham uh, continues. And some too that profess to be Latter-day Saints. And if you were to take the devils out of them and from about them, you would leave them dead corpses. For I believe there would be nothing left of them. So that some of these uh, Latter-day Saints, I guess, are, have been totally taken over. Their bodies have totally been taken over by the devils. If you were to take out all these devils, you would leave them dead corpses. <laughs> Terrifying stuff. All right. So it was a different church back in 1856. It was a, a church full of hellfire and brimstone. Um, a lot of fear scaring people uh, to obey the leaders of the church. Brigham Young continues here. Uh, same sermon. You can see the acts of these evil spirits in every place. The whole country is full of them. The whole earth is alive with them. And they are continually trying to get into the tabernacles of the human family. All right. Uh, this kind of a crazy sermon continues. <laughs> uh, well, these evil spirits are ready to prompt you. Do they prompt us? Yeah, I guess he's saying, do they prompt the general authorities? Uh, yes. Yes. And I could put my hands on a dozen of them while I have been on this stand. They are here on this stand. So while, he, while he's standing up speaking in front of the church, he says, I could put my hands on a dozen of these evil spirits uh, that are hanging around right 
near the stand uh, where he's speaking. Could we do without the devils? No, we could not get along without them. They are here and they suggest this, that, and the other. <laughs> All right, so about a week later, uh, Apostle and in the First Presidency, Heber C. Kimball gives another sermon. And again, he's talking about these evil spirits in England. Uh, he says, where will those go to, where will those go to that reject this gospel? They will remain where they are in hell, <laughs> fire and brimstone, uh, where my spirit was for a short time when I was in England. All right. Uh, the Apostle Heber continues, where was my body during that brief period? It was in Preston, England on the corner of Wilford Street. See picture above. But my spirit could see and observe those evil spirits as plainly as it ever will after I die. His spirit could see it. See, so it's his spiritual eyes. Legions of disembodied evil spirits came against me, organized in companies that they might have more power, but they had not power over me to any great extent because of the power that was in and sustaining me. And he'd, he'd probably say that is the priesthood power. Okay, he continues. I had the priesthood and the power of it was upon me. Oh, I guess that, eh? <laughs> I saw the invisible world of the condemned spirits, those who were opposed to me and to this work and to the lifting up of the standard of Christ in that country of England. Okay, uh, did I at the same time see or have a vision of the angels of God, of his legions? Uh, no, I did not. So he did not see the angels. Uh, though they were there and stood in defense of me and my brethren, and I knew it. All right. Uh, not that there was any very great virtue in me, but there was virtue in the priesthood and the apostleship which I held, and God would and did defend, and the evil spirits were dispersed by the power of God. All right. Some more scare tactics here from the apostle and in the first presidency, uh, Heber C. Kimball. 1856. Some people suppose that when they leave this state of existence, they are going into the paradise of God. But if they do not overcome evil and subject themselves to the will of God and to him that is appointed to lead us here in the flesh, aka Brigham Young, they will become subject to those wicked spirits. Okay, Heber continues. Angels will not come by legions to defend those whose faith fails them when the destroyer comes, or Satan. But he will be permitted to waste the wicked. More of that fire and brimstone. I never said that I ever saw an angel from God, though I have dreamed about them. So kind of his spiritual eyes again. All right, he continues. Neither did I see those evil spirits with my natural eyes, nor, nor was I at the time asleep, but I saw them after I was laid prostrate upon the floor. Neither did I see those evil spirits with my natural eyes. Same thing happened with the eight and three witnesses. All right, he tells us a little more of this experience in England. When I recovered, I sat upon the bed thinking and reflecting upon what had passed. And all at once my vision was opened, and the walls of the building were no obstruction to my seeing. He could see through walls. For I saw nothing but the visions that presented themselves. Okay, Heber continues. Why did not the walls obstruct my view? Because my spirit could look through the walls of that house. For I looked with that spirit, element, and power with which angels look. All right, so about five or six months later, November 29, 1856, Apostle and in the First Presidency, uh, Jedediah M. Grant uh, was very sick. Uh, he was had a sick night with pneumonia, uh, the worst that he has had since he has been sick. The devil worked all night to kill his body. And uh, this is according to the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff in his journal. 
All right. Uh, the brethren laid hands upon him, Jedediah M. Grant, laid hands upon him many times and rebuked the devil. All right. Wilford uh, continues his account here. The devil would lay upon him a strong hand from his feet to his head, all through his limbs and stomach and a rib at a time, a rib at a time. And it seemed as though he would crush his body. <laughs> the devil was going to crush Jedediah. All right, going to war with Satan. Wilford Woodruff account of uh, Jedediah M. Grant. Brother Grant, though very weak, would rebuke him for an hour at a time from limb to limb and rib to rib. And it was a perfect warfare all night. So Grant would rebuke uh, the devil for an hour at a time. And he was going to war with the devil. So it's kind of like uh, the devil or Satan here is causing this sickness. He, he's causing this pneumonia. All right. So a few days later, uh, Jedediah M. Grant uh, was dead. And uh, the prophet Brigham Young gave another speech on December 4th, 1856. He says, do you not think that Brother Jedediah can do more good than he could here? Good more, he can do more good uh, in the spirit world, I guess. Uh, when he was here, the devils had power over his flesh. He warred with them and fought them and said that they were around him. These evil spirits were around him by the millions and he fought them until he overcame them. All right, so the prophet Brigham Young continues here, uh, December 4th, 1856, sermon entitled On the Death of President Jedediah M. Grant. And uh, Brigham Young says something pretty remarkable here, basically saying that all sickness and disease is caused by the devil. <laughs> so he says, you never felt a pain and an ache or felt disagreeable or uncomfortable in your bodies and minds, but what an evil spirit was present causing it. Evil spirits causing all that. Do you realize that the egg or malaria, maybe, the fever, the chills, the severe pain in the head, the pleurisy, or any pain in the system from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet is put there by the devil. Basically all sickness, all disease put there by the devil. And uh, Jedediah was trying to fight off the devil. Uh, so that he wouldn't die of pneumonia. Uh, you do not real you do not realize this, do you? All right, Brigham continues. I say but little about this matter, because I do not want you to realize it. <laughs> he didn't want him to realize it. When you have the rheumatism, do you realize that the devil put that upon you? Devil causes rheumatism. No, but you say, I got wet and cold and thereby got the rheumatism. Well, that's a lot more likely, right? <laughs> All right, Prophet Brigham Young continues. The spirits that afflict us and plant the disease in our bodies, pain in the system, and finally death, have control over us so far as the flesh is concerned. So, yeah, 1856, they didn't know nearly as much as they know now, of course, about uh, medical science, uh, germ theory of disease. Uh, they didn't have antibiotics. They, they thought uh, that this kind of stuff was caused by evil spirits uh, or the devil. Okay, Brigham continues. When the spirit takes up the body again, in other words, resurrection, then the body also with the spirit will have control over every evil spirit that is in a tabernacle. The body and the spirit will have control over the evil spirits that are within your body or within your tabernacle. If there is any such being, just as far as the spirit that has the priesthood had control over evil spirits. So again, you can control evil spirits through the power of the priesthood. After you're resurrected, uh, your body and spirit will have control over these evil spirits that are in your tabernacle. It's kind of, this is kind of the idea of uh, body thetans uh, that you find in uh, Scientology. You can be possessed 
by thousands, I think even millions of these body thetans, basically evil spirits. All right, Brigham continues here in the same speech, 1856, December 4th. There are millions and millions of spirits in these valleys of Utah, both good and evil. We are surrounded with more evil spirits than good ones because more wicked than good men have died here. For instance, thousands and thousands of wicked Lamanites have laid their bodies in these valleys. Where did the Book of Mormon take place, according to Brigham Young? It's obvious here, right? North America, in Utah. Lamanites lived in Utah. <laughs> and uh, the wicked ones are still hanging around in the valleys of the Utah Territory. Millions and millions of them, of course, uh, we don't have the archaeological uh, records of these millions and millions of uh, people and bones. All right, back uh, to Isaac Russell, uh, this case of uh, demon possession in Preston, England. I told you there was a lot of information <laughs> about uh, these missions to Preston, England, and uh, we have more information about this from the da uh, daughter Isabella Russell Johnson in the history of Isaac Russell, October 1919, Isaac Russell Family Papers, Elton Perry Special Collections, uh, right at BYU. Uh, Isaac Russell lay apparently lifeless for three days and nights, the watchers never expecting to see him revive or, or regain consciousness. It was made plain to him at that time that he would soon be called from this life, that his work here would soon be ended. All right, the daughter Isabella Russell Johnson continues. Uh, he, Isaac Russell, told mother that the Savior and Satan stood by his bedside all that time, that Satan was contending for his soul, but the Savior claimed and delivered him from his power said that he was shown many things that it was not lawful for him to divulge even to her, even uh, to uh, uh, mother, uh, Isabella Russell Johnson's mother, uh, or I guess his wife. Okay, Isabella continues. I have often wondered and studied over the fact that when Satan gathered his legions and sought to destroy the elders, this is here in Preston, England, to prevent the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth, that their first attack was upon Father. He was one of the first converts in that neighborhood. Okay, uh, that the manifestation of the evil spirit's rage and hatred should be hurled at him, Isaac Russell, instead of Brother Kimball, who stood at the head of that mission. Okay, and there has always been something unaccountable and unsatisfactory and the thought that Satan had power to curtail his life's work, Isaac Russell's life's work, and to cover his name with a shadow and a reproach that rests upon it to this day. He seemed to wage a constant warfare against some unseen, against some unseen power. Constant warfare. So they cast it out for a time, then it would come back, right, according to his daughter. Probably dealing with uh, some suffering with some kind of mental illness. Okay, uh, Isabella continues. But again comes to my mind the picture and the mystery that I cannot fathom, that evil and a hatred from the unseen world pursued him even to the grave. So it's, we, we wonder what he was suffering from. All right, uh, another interesting interesting account here from Isabella. Uh, William Dawson was with him to the last, with uh, Isaac Russell. And I have heard from his lips and from the lips of my mother of the terrible power that opposed him when he tried to shave and prepare father for the grave. William, William Dawson, when he tried to shave and prepare father for the grave, some terrible power opposed him. Uh, that whenever he approached the corpse for that purpose, he was blinded, a darkness coming between him and my father's face until he had to give up the attempt. Okay, moving on to another account of the same issues here. This is the Apostle Orson Hyde's journal 
in the church newspaper, the Elder's Journal, October 1837, so not long after this, uh, these events occurred. Orson says that Elder Russell was much troubled with evil spirits and came into the room where Elder Kimball and Elder Hyde were sleeping and desired us to lay our hands on him and rebuke the evil spirit. Okay, I, Orson Hyde, arose upon the bed, and Brother Kimball got upon the floor, and I sat upon the bed. We laid our hands on him, and Brother Kimball rebuked and prayed for him. All right, uh, but just before Heber C. Kimball had finished the prayer, his voice faltered, and his mouth was shut, and he began to tremble and reel to and fro, and fell on the floor like a dead man and uttered a deep groan. Okay, Orson Hyde's journal account continues. Uh, I, Orson, immediately seized him, Isaac Russell, by the shoulder and lifted him up, being satisfied that the devils were exceedingly angry because we attempted to cast them out uh, of Brother Russell. And they made a powerful attempt upon Elder Kimball as if to dispatch him at once. Okay, they struck Heber senseless, I guess the evil spirits, and he fell to the floor. Brother Russell and myself then laid our hands on Elder Kimball and rebuked the evil spirits in the name of Jesus Christ, and immediately he recovered his strength in part so as to get up. Uh, so, <laughs> um, Cast them out of one person, they go into another. Okay, the sweat began to roll from Heber C. Kimball most powerfully. The sweat began to soak him. And he was almost as wet as if he had been taken out of the water. We could very sensibly hear the evil spirits rage and foam out their shame. Brother Kimball was quite weak for a day or two after. Okay, the Apostle Orson Hyde continues. It seems that the devils are determined to destroy us and prevent the truth from being declared in England. The devil was mad because I was going to baptize and he wanted, he wanted to destroy me, that I should not do those things that the Lord sent me to do. Okay, so in the same edition of the Elder's Journal, October 1837, uh, the Apostle Heber C. Kimball gives another account as well. We had a great struggle to deliver ourselves from his hands. When they left Brother Russell, they pitched upon me, Heber, and when they left me, they fell upon Brother Hyde, for we could hear them gnash their teeth upon us. All right, some more information from the Apostle Heber C. Kimball uh, back in uh, that book, Life of Heber C. Kimball, 1888. Um, so, uh, Heber C. Kimball says, years later, narrating the experience of that awful morning to the prophet Joseph Smith, telling uh, Joseph about it, Heber asked him what it all meant and whether there was anything wrong with him that he should have such a manifestation. All right. So what was Joseph Smith's reply? He says, no, brother Heber, nothing wrong with you. At that time, you were nigh unto the Lord. There was only a veil between you and him, but you could not see him. When I heard of it, it gave me great joy, for I knew that the work of God was taking root in that land uh, of England. Okay, so Joseph Smith further explains here, same book, Life of Heber C. Kimball. It was this that caused the devil to make a struggle to kill you. Joseph then related some of his own experience in many contests that he had had with the evil one and said, the nearer a person approaches the Lord, a greater power will be manifested by the adversary to prevent the accomplishment of his purposes. Um, so basically, yeah, uh, spreading the gospel through England, uh, that's what caused the devil to make a struggle uh, to kill you, uh, Heber. All right, so we're finally done <laughs> with Preston, England. Uh, let's move on to another account. Uh, this shows up in the autobiography of John Pulsifer. Uh, he lived from 1827 to 1891. You can find it at boap.org. 
This occurred in 1838 in uh, Dayton, Ohio. See the picture above for 19th century picture. Uh, the devil entered our camp and got possession of one of the sisters. She was in awful pain and talked all the time. And some of the time she talked in rhyme. The elders administered to her. All right. Uh, John Pulsifer continues here about this uh, 1838 account in Dayton, Ohio. The evil spirits left her and entered another person, and on being rebuked again, would enter another person, and so continued a good part of the night. Get them out of one, they go into another. But when the devil was commanded in the name of Jesus Christ to leave the camp, he went and was very mad. The devil was very mad. Okay, uh, the devil went through the whole camp making a roaring noise, knocked over chairs, broke table legs, and made awful work. All right, let's go to a different account from Lorenzo Brown, the account of the healing of Sister Crosby. Church History Library, uh, this is, is an account from early 1839. On this day passed a marvelous scene before the elders of Israel, vis-a-vis -vis Benjamin Brown, Henry Moore, and Melvin Brown, who was called to cast out devils, which had entered Sister Crosby. Okay, Lorenzo's account continues. The healing of Sister Crosby. After praying and fasting 17 hours by the power of the Holy Ghost, one of these evil spirits was cast out which was seen and felt, for he attacked all of us. Uh, one of the devils shook Brother Brown on the side and in the face, seized Brother Moore on the arms, which made them sore for some time. Also Brother Melvin on the shoulders and on the arms. How do these disembodied spirits uh, physically harm people? <laughs> all right, Lorenzo's account continues early 1839 uh, brother Melvin could but just stand his arms was sore for some time the devil was seen in the room for some time and at length entered into brother Melvin the devil entered into brother Melvin with such power that it seemed as he would be pressed to death okay uh, brother Melvin could not speak but made signs when we laid hands on him and we cast the devil out in the name of Jesus Christ. When the devil came out, he came snarling like a dog. All right, Lorenzo continues. On the 18th, we cast out 37 demons in a variety of forms and noises, some like dogs, cats, hogs, pigs, and snakes. So quite a variety here of uh, these 37 demons that were cast out. All right, these were seen and heard by many of the saints. The room became darkened like a mist, and the smell was like brimstone, and more filthy it affected our eyes so that we had to wash them. Okay, Lorenzo continues. Our mouths were much affected. Some heard noises like thunder and saw it lightning. Thunder and lightning. Some were punched in the face. <laughs> These are some pretty nasty spirits. Pictured above, we have a guy uh, getting punched in the face on the Pantera album, Vulgar Display of Power. Uh, I dedicate this slide, <laughs> Pantera, to my friend uh, Brandon Atkinson. Okay, uh, others were punched in the arms. Others heard him gnash with his teeth. So there were many witnesses, both men and women, in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, we get a different account here of the same events from uh, Benjamin Brown. Testimonies for the Truth in the book Gems for the Young Folks, 1881. So this is for the young, uh, young kids. <laughs> I'm not sure how young it goes down to. Uh, but at, at least teenagers, uh, these kind of stories will s scare the crap out of the, the youth of the church. So Benjamin Brown, he's talking about this, the same lady here. The case was that of a sister who was possessed. 
and whom I, with two other elders, was called upon to visit. Directly we entered her room. She called out, Take your shoes off from your feet. This is holy ground. The prophet Elijah is here at her house. So maybe experiencing some delusions. Okay, Benjamin Brown's account continues. In Gems for the Young Folk. <laughs> I saw the spirit by which she was influenced. So I walked up to her and said, I am a servant of the Lord. I obey no command of the devil. She became uproarious directly, for all who had gone in previously had complied with her directions. Okay, as soon as we attempted to rebuke the evil spirit in the name of the Lord, she arose up from the bed on her feet, without apparently bending a joint in her body. As stiff as, an, uh, as stiff as a rod of iron. That would be interesting, right? <laughs> Just rise up from the bed without bending a joint in your body. Uh, try that at home, uh, kids. All right. Uh, the account continues from Gems for the Young Folks, fourth book of the Faith Promoting Series, designed for the instruction and encouragement of young Latter-day Saints, 1881 and to scare the crap out of them uh, through undue influence. Uh, but anyway, uh, the account continues. From this, we saw the power with which we had to contend. And failing at first to eject the spirit, we bowed ourselves in prayer before the Lord and asked him to assist us. Okay, uh, the evil spirit then came out full of fury and as he passed by one of the brethren, he seized him by both arms and gripped them uh, violently. Okay, uh, passing towards me, something which by the feel appeared like a man's hand grasped me by both sides of the face and attempted to pull me sideways to the ground. But the hold appearing to slip, I recovered my balance immediately. Okay, uh, my face was sore for some days after this. The other brother that was seized was lame for a week afterwards. All right, Benjamin Brown continues. As soon as this was done, the sister partly recovered, so much so that she obeyed everything that I chose to tell her to do, whereas before she was perfectly ungovernable. Okay, uh, still she seemed to be surrounded by some evil influence. This puzzled us, for we knew that the spirit was cast out, but we learned the cause afterwards. Just then it was revealed to us that if we went to sleep, the devil would enter one of the brethren. Okay, my nephew Melvin Brown neglected the warning and composed himself to sleep in an armchair. Uh, while, we were, while we were still watching with a sister, directly he did so, the devil entered into him, and he became black in the face, and he nearly suffocated. Okay, he awoke immediately and motioned for us to lay hands on him, for he could not speak. We did so, and the evil spirit then left him, and he recovered at once. All right, Benjamin Brown continues... About a week afterwards, the same spirit re-entered the sister. Or she had another seizure, uh, or she had another issue with a mental health crisis. Uh, and this time fully confessed his character. In answer to our inquiries, he said that his name was Legion, uh, which means many. All right, uh, so how does Benjamin Brown explain this? Well, he says, uh, this explained how it was that the woman, after we had cast out an evil spirit, was under an, e was under an evil influence again, for there must have been many spirits. All right, so this evil spirit uh, actually talked to them, and we have a little bit of the record here uh, for what he said. Uh, he also reviled our priesthood, but he had to submit to it at last, saying to us, Oh, you have the priesthood, have you? Well, then cast me out. Command me to come out. So that's supposedly what the Spirit said. Trying to shake our faith and thus incapacitate us to rebuke him successfully. 
All right, failing in this, he tried another method by entering me. I felt seized by a strange influence, and every question put to the woman I knew the answer that she was going to give, for I was possessed by a similar spirit. The story just gets more and more elaborate. All right, this broke the chain of our union and strength. Consequently, I requested the elders to rebuke the evil spirit from me, after which, at our united rebuke, he left the woman. All right, so why did this poor lady get uh, possessed by evil spirits? Uh, because she took it upon herself to rebuke the elders. <laughs> Standing up to priesthood authority, that'll get you possessed. Uh, so the account uh, continues. Previous to this, the sister had been a very faithful saint, and she ever afterwards was. But she had given the devil ground by encouraging a spirit contrary to the order of the church, taking upon herself to rebuke the elders, and he claimed his right by virtue of her transgression. All right, so what was the point of all this? What was the purpose? Benjamin Brown thinks that he's figured it out. He says, no doubt one of the objects of the Lord in permitting him to exercise his physical power was to give me experience of such facts without which I never could have known. All right, the next case that we're going to go into is that of Newell Knight. It's probably the most well-known case of demon possession in the church, and it happened in 1830 early in 1830, uh, Joseph Smith cast out a devil from a Newell Knight. There's quite a bit of information about this as well. This probably should have, I probably should have put this earlier in the video. Not sure why <laughs> it's here at the hour and 41 minute mark, but, it, but that's where I put it, I guess. So anyway, this is a statement from John L. Brooke, pictured above from his excellent book, The Refiner's Fire came out in 1994 as pictured above uh, the book is the making of Mormon cosmology 1644 to 1844 so before the church and then uh, up to 1844 so um, uh, John Brooke says the event that sealed Joseph Smith's reputation as a charismatic prophet was his miraculous exorcism of Newell Knight who claimed to be possessed by the devil when he fell into a wild fit one evening early in 1830. All right, uh, the Joseph Smith history on uh, josephsmithpapers.org talks about this as well. It says, uh, the first miracle which was done in this church or by any member of it was the exorcism of Newell Knight in which the devil himself was claimed to have been cast out an act that was described by Joseph Smith as being done by God and by the power of godliness. All right, we have some more information about this uh, case uh, from Professor Stephen C. Taysom. Uh, he wrote a very good uh, chapter uh, in the book, Continuing Revelation, Essays on Doctrine, which came out in 2021. Uh, the chapter is entitled, Satan Mourns Naked Upon the Earth. Taysom is kind of an, an expert in these sorts of issues. So he says, uh, and he's pictured above here. He says, in April 1830, Joseph Smith, the 24-year-old founding prophet of Mormonism, entered a small log home in rural New York to find a young friend, Newell Knight, in agony. Uh, so... And then he, he gives uh, the source of Joseph Smith's history again. All right. Uh, so Taysom gives the account here. Uh, Knight's visage, how do you say that? Knight's visage and limbs were distorted and twisted into every possible shape and appearances. Knight then levitated and was thrown violently around the room. Pretty impressive, right? Kind of sounds like a seizure. And we get a little bit more information from Obadiah Dogberry, also known as Abner Cole, editor of the Palmyra Reflector, June 30, 1830 account here. So very early on. 
the satirical Palmyra Reflector uh, account supports the idea that the most salient element of the event was the pain that the devil inflicted upon night. Okay, the Palmyra Reflector quoted Knight as saying that his flesh was about to cleave from my bones. I guess be torn from his bones. The muscles, the tendons, etc. could no longer perform their different functions. The habitation of Satan was about to be laid open to the light of day when the prophet interfered. All right, and uh, Joseph Smith actually got in trouble with the law for performing an exorcism uh, and for treasure digging with his peep stone. This is probably the night, uh, the Newell Knight case. Not 100% sure, but uh, D. Michael Quinn mentions this in the Mormon Hierarchy Origins of Power book. Uh, he says, uh, June 30th to July 1st of 1830, Joseph Smith is acquitted in two trials at Colesville, New York for using a treasure digging peep stone and for performing an exorcism. <laughs> All right, so back to the account uh, from Professor Stephen C. Taysom, uh, which he gets out of the Joseph Smith History of the Church, 1839, josephsmithpapers.org. Uh, Taysom says, to Joseph Smith, it was clear that this was the work of Satan. Word of the strange happenings quickly spread and a handful of neighbors and family members gathered in astonishment. And pictured above, we have a uh, Newell Knight. All right, Joseph Smith history continues. Eventually, Joseph Smith was able to get close enough to Knight to grasp his hand, at which point Knight requested with great earnestness that I should cast the devil out of him, that he knew that he was in him, and that he also knew that I, Joseph Smith, could cast him out. All right, Joseph Smith rebuked the devil and commanded him in the name of Jesus Christ to depart from him. Newell Knight then claimed to see Satan leave his body and vanish from his sight. All right, Fawn Brody mentions this case of Newell Knight in her book, No Man Knows My History, 1945. Joseph Smith must have been overwhelmed by this miracle of Newell Knight, for he, had, for he had no idea how common were such occurrences, like convulsions and epilepsy, she says. These were common occurrences, but they didn't have the medical knowledge to know what they were. Uh, he was, he, Joseph Smith, was as unsophisticated as the rest of the village about mental therapy. Okay, so we know that Joseph Smith cast out a devil from Newell Knight. I guess Newell Knight learned uh, from Joseph Smith how to do it because he later went on uh, to cast out a devil or an evil spirit from his aunt. Uh, this is from Newell Knight's autobiography, August 1830 in the Church History Library. Uh, Knight is pictured above. He says, I, Newell Knight, dressed myself and having asked my Heavenly Father to give me wisdom and power to rebuke the destroyer from the habitation, I went to the room where my aunt lay. Okay, so Newell Knight continues here in his auto autobiography, August 1830. Uh, his aunt was in a most fearful condition. Her eyes were closed, and she appeared to be in the last agonies of death. The last agonies of death. Presently, she opened her eyes and bade her husband and children farewell, because she was going to die, telling them that she must die for the redemption of this generation, as Jesus Christ had died for the generation in his day. So... She's putting herself up here as kind of this Messiah figure. She's going to offer the atonement <laughs> for the redemption of her generation, just like Jesus Christ offered the atonement uh, for his generation. So she's obviously uh, suffering here uh, from some kind of uh, mental illness. Okay, Newell continues. 
Uh, her whole frame shook, and she appeared to be racked with the most exquisite pain and torment. Again, symptoms of a uh, seizure. Her hands and feet were cold, and the blood settled in her fingers, while her husband and children stood weeping around her bed. All right, uh, this was a scene that was new to me, and I felt that she was suffering under the power of Satan. Uh, that was the same spirit that had bound and overpowered me at the time that Joseph Smith cast him out. So he's referring back to his experience when Joseph Smith uh, cast Satan out of uh, Newell Knight. I now cried unto the Lord for strength and wisdom that we might prevail over this wicked and delusive power. All right, same account here. Uh, just at this time, my uncle cried aloud to me, saying, O oh, Brother Newell, cannot something be done? I felt the Holy Spirit of the Lord rest upon me as he said this, and I immediately stepped forward, took her by the hand, her, his aunt took her by the hand, and commanded Satan in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to depart. Okay, uh, the account continues. I told my aunt that she would not die, but that she should live to see her children grown up, that Satan had deceived her and put a lying spirit into her mouth, that Christ had made the only and last atonement for all who would, for all who would believe on his name, and that there should be no more shedding of blood for sin. She believed and stretched forth her hand and cried unto me, and Satan departed from her. So again, she's thinking she's she's going to be Jesus or Christ and die for the sins of her generation. But uh, apparently he corrected her. Okay, uh, so let's go to a different uh, possession story. This one is from the Apostle Wilford Woodruff when he was on his mission to England in 1840. It can be found in the book, uh, Wilford Woodruff, History of His Life and Labors by Matthias F. Cowley, 1909. So Wilford says, as soon as I was introduced to William Clayton, he informed me that one of the sisters in that place was possessed of a devil. This is in England. Uh, he asked me if I would not go and cast it out of her because, you know, he was an apostle. Um, he thought that one of the twelve apostles could do most anything in such a case. They have a lot of priesthood power, right? I went with him to the house where the woman lay. She was in the hands of three men in a terrible rage. All right. Uh, she, she was trying to tear her clothing from her. She's trying to tear her clothing off. I also found quite a number of saints present and some unbelievers who had come to see the devil cast out and a miracle wrought. All right, Apostle Wilford Woodruff uh, continues. Uh, I joined with William Clayton in administering to the woman. The unbelief of the wicked who were present was so great that we could not cast the devil out of her. And she raged worse than ever. So they couldn't cast the devil out. Their excuse was there was too much unbelief from the wicked who were present. <laughs> okay, uh, Wilford continues. He's on his mission to England in 1840. Uh, three years after the last big long account we uh, went over, uh, that was 1837. Uh, I then ordered the room to be cleared. And when the company, except the few attending her, had left the house, we laid hands upon her head. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I commanded the devil to come out of her. Okay, uh, the devil left, and she was entirely healed and fell asleep. The next day being the Sabbath, the woman came before a large congregation of people and bore testimony to what the Lord had done for her. Kind of uh, like uh, pictured above. All right, uh, Wilford continues. 
On Monday morning, the devil, not being satisfied with being cast out of the woman, entered into her little child. So they cast it out of the woman, but then the devil went into her child, uh, which which was but a few months old. <laughs> I wonder how they could tell uh, that it wasn't something else. She's only a few months old, and apparently the devil uh, went into her. I was called upon to visit the child and found it in great distress, writhing, or writhing in its mother's arms. Okay, uh, Wilford continues here. We laid our hands upon it. That is the, the young baby, only a few months old. We laid hands upon it and cast the devil out. The evil spirits thereafter had no power over that household. This was done by the power of God and not of man. We laid hands upon 20 in Manchester. This is in uh, England or the UK. Uh, we laid hands upon 20 who were sick and most of them were healed. All right. Uh, we have another account of some evil spirits attacking uh, Apostle Wilford Woodruff. Uh, on his mission, uh, this is from his journal, uh, an October 18, 1840 entry. Uh, so he says here in his journal, uh, We retired to rest in good season, and I felt well in my mind and slept until 12 at night, midnight I guess. I awoke and meditated upon the things of God until near 3 o'clock in the morning. And while forming, a deter while forming a determination to warn the people in London, England, and overcome the power of darkness by the assistance of God. Warn the people in London, England, and overcome the powers of darkness. All oh, these evil spirits that are lurking about. Okay, Apostle and Missionary Wilfred Woodruff continues here in his journal, October of 1840. A person appeared unto me, which I considered was the prince of darkness or the devil. He made war with me and attempted to take my life. He caught me by the throat and choked me nearly to death. <laughs> uh, I guess that's kind of a common a trope amongst possession cases, uh, that the evil spirits uh, can choke you uh, around the throat. Okay, uh, Wilford continues. Uh, the devil wounded me in my forehead, and I also wounded him in a number of places in the head. <laughs> How do you wound a spirit? Uh, as he was about to overcome me, I prayed to the Father in the name of Jesus for help. I then had power over him, and he left me, though much wounded. Three personages dressed in white came to me and prayed with me, and I was immediately healed. They delivered me from all my troubles. Okay, let's move on to a different possession story here. This one is regarding Lorenzo Snow. It can be found in the biography and family record of Lorenzo Snow. Uh, by Eliza R. Snow, uh, written in 1884. Around April of 1841, Lorenzo Snow was called to preside over the church in London, England. Maybe kind of like a mission president. Uh, not long after this, a circumstance occurred which plainly illustrated the interference of evil spirits in human affairs. Okay, a band of evil spirits undertook to frighten him from his post, frighten Lorenzo Snow. But Lorenzo Snow is one who neither favor, fright, nor force can move from the post of duty. These evil spirits were not going to interfere with uh, his missionary work and his other church work that he was doing. Okay, so the story continues. 
Uh, one night after retiring to bed at night, he, Lorenzo Snow, was aroused from sleep by the most discordant noises. It seemed, it seemed as though every piece of furniture in the room was put into motion, going slash dash, helter skelter, back and forth against each other in such terrible fury that sleep and rest were utter impossibilities. All right. Uh, Lorenzo Snow endured the unceremonious visitation for several nights, each night thinking that it was the last. Something must be done. He must claim the right of master over his own premises. All right. Uh, Mission President Lorenzo Snow, uh, his story continues. After a day of fasting and before kneeling to pray, Lorenzo read aloud a chapter in the Bible, and then in the name of Jesus Christ, or in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and by the authority of the holy priesthood, he rebuked those spirits and commanded them to leave the house, went to bed, and had no more disturbance. All right, the story continues. Uh, this book was written by Eliza R. Snow, pictured above here. Uh, but those spirits were not discouraged with one defeat. It was not long before several members of the church became disaffected and came out in open rebellion, insomuch that it was painfully necessary to expel quite a number of evil spirits. So, so why were these evil spirits lurking around? Because... Uh, different church members became disaffected and came out in open rebellion against the church. So I guess they would, the members of the church would say, that's what I am doing. Uh, but I will testify to you <laughs> that uh, I, that there's no evil spirits um, trying to mess with me in uh, my house. All right. Uh, there's actually a case of a uh, kind of like an exorcism in the Mormon temple endowment ceremony. Uh, I guess it's still in there. There's been so many changes. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but at the very least it used to be. Um, this information I got again from professor Stephen C. Taysom in his uh, chapter in, in the continuing revelation book, which we've already talked about. Uh, so, uh, Stephen says the LDS Temple Endowment Ritual contains a drama which enacts the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Uh, Joseph Smith introduced the Endowment Ritual in 1842. All right. Uh, in the LDS version of this story, it is Satan himself who convinces Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. You can see uh, one of the uh, pictures from the Temple Endowment film here above. Okay. Uh, and it is Satan who is cast out and cursed by God, but not before Satan threatens to take the spirits that follow me and they shall possess the bodies thou createst for Adam and Eve. So there's that threat there. Uh, that those that follow him, he's going to take possession of their bodies, uh, demon possession. And then uh, I believe it's Peter James or John here on the left picture, raises his arm to the square and commands Satan, who's the picture here on the right. He commands Satan in the name of Jesus Christ uh, to depart. And Satan has no choice because he's subject to the power of the priesthood and the power of of Jesus. Okay, let's move on to a different possession account. Uh, this is in the autobiography and journal of Pretty Meeks um, in an article in the Utah Historical Quarterly, Quarterly 1942. Uh, so this uh, possession story occurred sometime around 1843 in Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, Pretty Meeks is pictured above here. He says, I was so desperately sick or sickly that I run myself down and took sick myself. 
I took medicine that broke up my disease, but I was so weak and feeble that the spirits of affliction or evil spirits or disembodied spirits or the devil, if you please, got possession of me and come near killing me. All right. Uh, the story of Pretty Meeks continues here. <clears throat> All right. He says, they would torment me nights so that I could not rest, let alone sleep. Of a morning, I was so tired that I was almost dead. I lay down with a heavy heart. Something seemed to say, though I heard nothing. So he's using his spiritual ears here. Something seemed to say, put the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Mormon under your head and do not consent to them or not do not consent to the evil spirits and they can have no power over you so he's hearing stuff in his head here <laughs> put the doctrine and covenants or the book of mormon un under your head and that will protect you this is not a very rational uh kind of way of thinking here uh, maybe he's suffering from some kind of uh, mental illness okay uh, pretty meeks continues uh, I did so. So I guess he put, he doesn't say what he put, either the DNC or the Book of Mormon under his head. I did so and covered up my head and shut my eyes. I shut my eyes, musing in my mind, thinking what will be next. And then I saw the three devils coming that always come uh, together to pester me. Okay, the account uh, continues here. Uh, the middle devil was a large man, dark complexion, black eyes and hair and snaggle tooth, snaggle teeth, big nose and high cheekbones and an old black wool hat. He's getting pretty imaginative here. Okay, Pretty Meeks continues. Uh, he was extremely ugly. He looked very vicious. He looked like a devil. The other two were smaller and better dressed and appeared bright and affable like men of education. One of them appeared to be a spokesman. One of them looked considerable like Orson Hyde. <laughs> so was Orson Hyde an evil spirit? Uh, maybe. Okay, Pretty continues. P-R-I-D-D-Y. They approached me with a great deal of caution for fear that they would not get my consent. I laid still, I laid still to hear what they would say full of determination. They appeared to be about three feet from me when they stopped. Okay, I drew back my fist and aimed to strike him right in the belly and said, clear yourselves, you devils. I do not want anything to do with you. And I have never been troubled with them in that way since but I have had considerable to do with them in working against their power over other people. Maybe he's participated in other exorcisms, uh, but they have never captured me and made a slave of me. So just th that idea that we can become slaves uh, to evil spirits goes against the plan of salvation, right? For free agency. Okay. Pretty continues. Many times the devils come in my presence and trouble me like a drunken man would. See picture above. <laughs> but the best way to keep them off is to get the word of God in your head and heart instead of under it. <laughs> so read your scriptures. Get, get the ideas of the scriptures in your head and in your heart. Then you won't have to put the scriptures under your head uh, when you're sleeping to protect yourself from the evil spirits. Best to get it in your head and heart and keep the commandments, which is far better than to depend on putting it under your head. All right. He's going to talk about a different person now, I guess, that got possessed by evil spirits. He's going to talk about William Meeks. Uh, so he says, it was likely it was the same three devils or evil spirits that troubled William Meeks while he lived in Nauvoo. I guess he's a relative of some sort. They would trouble him in the daytime. They came to trouble him one morning about 10 o'clock. 
All right, the story continues. Uh, send for John Henderson, William said. William Meeks said. One of the devils said, what good can he do? He chews tobacco. <laughs> what good is he going to do to cast out these devils? He chews tobacco. So you can see that those who do not keep the word of wisdom do not have the same power over evil spirits as those who keep it. If you're not keeping the word of wisdom, you know, the evil spirits might be lurking around you more. Okay, let's go to a different possession story. Uh, this one can be found in early scenes in church history. For the youth, 1882. Exorcism stories, evil spirit stories for the youth. <laughs> uh, you know they don't do this kind of stuff anymore, right? It would scare the crap out of these young kids nowadays. I'm sure it did then too. All right, so sometime in the year 1844, when H.G.B. was on his mission in Virginia, he followed Sister Litz into a house, and there lay a girl stretched upon a bed, apparently lifeless, uh, without breath or motion. All right, so this H.G.B. guy, not sure what his full name was, was on his mission uh, in 1844, and uh, he followed Sister Litz into a house, and there was this girl, uh, probably possessed. Okay, early scenes in church history for the youth. I began to cast a devil out of her. I commanded it in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, come out of her, and not to return again. The evil spirit immediately departed from her, she being restored to her normal condition. Uh, okay, so here's the title page, Early Scenes of Church History, 8th book of the Faith Promoting Series, designed for the instruction and encouragement of young Latter-day Saints, and to provide undue influence over them by scaring the bejesus out of them. Uh, not ten minutes after, the same evil spirit entered another girl, and we cast it out. A third young sister was also attacked. And we cast it out. These evil spirits are going into everybody around here. Okay, the story continues. Uh, while possessed with this evil spirit, they would choke up. I guess choke. Ceasing to breathe until they were black in the face. And we thought that they would surely die. Sometimes they would froth at the mouth and act like they were in a fit. Remember, those are... Uh, Symptoms of seizure, frothing at the mouth, and being in a fit. Okay. If standing upon their feet when taken, taken by the evil spirit, I guess, they would fall to the floor and act like they were struggling for life with some unseen power. Fall to the floor, struggle for life. Sounds like a seizure, right? We never made a failure when attempting to cast out this evil spirit from either of the girls. Okay, let's go back to the prophet Brigham Young, April 17, 1853 sermon. He says, the Lord Almighty will not let anything endure that offers hospitality to the devil and his imps. What is an imp? It's a small mischievous devil. Okay, Brigham continues. Those who suffer their bodies to be dwellings for evil spirits, kind of makes it sound like it's your fault, right? They must suffer loss, for devils cannot construct a house that will, that will in any way answer their purpose. They don't have bodies. For they are trying all the time to get into our dwellings or bodies because they have none of their own. All right, Brigham continues. If any of you have suffered any of these houseless spirits to enter you, if any of you have suffered it to happen, so again, he's blaming uh, the person. If this has happened to you, turn them out, and they will perhaps seek refuge in the body of an ox or some other animal, or be gone into the Jordan, I guess the Jordan River. All right, uh, the prophet Brigham Young continues. Do you think the legion that we read of, legion of evil spirits, that entered the swine in the days of Christ, 
had bodies of their own. No, they did not. And we went through that whole account. They have no meeting houses, but in ballrooms, gaming houses, brothels, gin palaces, parlors, bedrooms, and other places, which they frequent. The evil spirits frequent these places in the bodies of those that they lead captive. So he basically says, you know, if you get these evil spirits, it's kind of your fault. Don't hang out at the wrong kind of places. Don't gamble in Vegas. Don't go to brothels or parlors. Uh, the evil spirits will get inside your body. Okay, Prophet Brigham continues. The evil spirits are wandering to and fro in the earth, seeking to possess tabernacles or bodies that other spirits not of their order already occupy. They are in our midst, watching for an opportunity to enter where they may. So, scary stuff. All right. Uh, what will be the doom of those who give way to them and yield to them the possession of their tabernacles? So it's kind of up to us, right? Don't choose to yield <laughs> to these evil spirits. Yield to, to having your body possessed. They will wander to and fro. These are the people that get evil spirits. Happiness will be, will be hid from them. They will weep and wail and suffer until their bodies return to their mother earth and their spirits to judgment. All right, let's go to a different possession story from the diary of Phineas W. Cook. Guess it was uh, put out in 1980. This entry, however, is on November 8, 1853. It's about his wife, uh, Catherine. Uh, so Catherine got worse and worse until the devil had perfect control over her. No one could do anything for her but Anne Eliza. And she tried every way she could to kill her until she had to be tied hand and foot. Sounds like suffering from mental, mental illness. All right, Diary of Phineas Cook, 1853 entry. We tried the priesthood, but she defied its power. At last I told the bishop that if she could be baptized seven times, I thought she would get better. So the bishop told me to go and do it. <laughs> Maybe if we baptize the person seven times, the evil spirits will leave. Okay, we put her down carefully into the water, and I attempted to baptize her. It seemed to me that my strength was nearly gone. We succeeded the second time that they tried to baptize her, which caused the devil to rage and foam worse than ever. All right, Phineas continues. Uh, finding by this time that a powerful influence was operating against me, I was compelled to give it up. She got worse and worse and put her foot in the fire and burned it badly and then swore that it was me. <laughs> she would throw everything in the fire that she could get her hands on. Not acting rationally here, right? Okay, the story continues. I started Monday, November 10th, 1853, determined still to overcome, and took to prayer and fasting. This I kept up until Friday night, so almost a week, and I heard a loud thumping under the floor where I was at work, and as there was no entrance there, I knew well that I had gained a victory over the evil spirits that was possessing her, and they had taken that method to revenge themselves. Okay, Diary of Phineas Cook. Saturday the 15th, I got home and found my testimony had been true as she got over her madness. She was very cross at times and ugly to Anne, Eliza, and her mother and made several attempts to injure them. She circulated the story that I, that I had whipped her nearly to death. Not in her rational mind here. All right, a little bit of information from the Apostle Parley P. Pratt in his book, Key to the Science of Theology, which came out in 1855. Pratt says, Spirits of the departed who are unhappy 
and who linger in lonely wretchedness about the earth. The more wicked of these are the kind spoken of in Scripture as foul spirits, unclean spirits, spirits who sometimes enter human bodies and will distract them, throw them into fits, cast them into the water, into the fire, etc. All right, uh, here Pratt gets pretty specific here <laughs> about these demon possessions. Uh, the spirits of the departed will trouble them with dreams, nightmares, hysterics, and fever, etc. They will also deform them in body and in features, deform them by convulsions, cramps, contortions, etc. Sounds like a seizure. And will sometimes compel them to utter blasphemies, horrible curses, and even words of other languages. Okay, the Apostle Pratt continues here. 1855 book. Some of these foul spirits, when possessing a person, will cause a disagreeable smell about the person thus possessed. <laughs> which will be plainly manifest to the senses of those about him, even though the person thus afflicted should be washed and changed his clothes every few minutes, there's still this uh, disgusting smell <laughs> about people who are possessed. All right, what else about these evil spirits? Well, Pratt will tell us. There are, in fact, most awful instances of the spirit of lust and of body and abominable words and actions inspired and uttered by persons possessed of such spirits. Even though the persons were virtuous and modest, so long as they possessed their own agency, some of these spirits caused deafness, others dumbness, etc., all right, a new account here from the Apostle and in the First Presidency, Jedediah M. Grant, speech in 1855. He says, people neglect to anoint with oil. They neglect to anoint with oil when they should and might use it. I have seen the elders try to cast out devils, and to accomplish it they have fasted and prayed and laid on hands and rebuked the devil, but he would not go out. Why not? I have seen them bring consecrated oil and anoint the person possessed of the devil, and the devil went out forthwith. So don't, for, don't forget to bring your consecrated oil, or you may not be able to uh, cast out the evil spirits. Okay, some information from the prophet Brigham Young, 1856 sermon reported in the Journal of Wilfred Woodruff, June 22, 1856. So Young says, The devils were cast out of heaven to this earth, and they are still around us. Their condemnation is that they can never have a tabernacle, but they seek to get into the tabernacle of all the men that they can. All right, the Apostle Lorenzo Snow gives us some information here in a speech, January 18, 1857. If you find that you are surrounded by a host of evil spirits that are choking you to death, have the presence of mind enough to call upon the Lord. But some have not had presence of mind enough for that. And we've gone through some cases. I think Wilfred Woodruff was being choked. Uh, some other people, evil spirits, will choke you with their spirit bodies, right? <laughs> All right, another sermon from the prophet Brigham Young talking about uh, demon or devil possession. November 22, 1857. You need not flatter yourselves for a moment that the devil has left us. You will find that he marshals his forces more particularly against this people. And if we are now clear from those unhallowed spirits and the tabernacles they occupied, you may expect that he will, if possible, find somebody here in whom he can have a resting place. He will find a body amongst the saints. The devil will go into it and rest. Okay, Brigham continues here in the same speech. 
1857. You will, you will learn that the wicked disembodied spirits have not left this people. There are myriads of disembodied evil spirits. Those who have long ago laid down their bodies here, like the Lamanites, and in the regions round about, among and around us, and they are trying to make us and our children sick. What's the cause of sickness and disease? Devil, evil spirits, <laughs> and are trying to destroy us and to tempt us uh, to do evil. All right, so these evil spirits can actually kill us. According to the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff, January 22, 1865 speech, when the first missionaries went to England, disembodied spirits sought to destroy them. And had there not been an angel of salvation present, they would have been slain. Nothing but the power of God saved them. Good thing that angel of salvation was there. Okay, the Apostle Wilford Woodruff continues. The visions of their minds were opened that they saw many of the devils that sought their destruction through their mind's eye, although not in the body, but in the spirit. And they stood before them like wicked, hideous men come to destroy them. All right, the very superstitious and loyal follower of Brigham Young, uh, the apostle Wilford Woodruff, 1865 speech, same speech here, Sometimes the evil spirits are invisible, and sometimes they are in the tabernacles of men. In Carthage jail, they came in the bodies of men and were under the influence of the devil and succeeded in shedding the blood of the prophet Joseph Smith. This evil power is manifest and visible more and more as we progress in the kingdom of God. Uh, those, the mob that gathered outside of the Carthage jail were apparently possessed by evil spirits. And so they killed uh, Hiram and Joseph. Okay, some more information from the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff, December 12th, 1869, in a sermon. There is a vast number of fallen spirits cast out with the devil here on the earth. They do not die and disappear. They have not bodies, only as they enter the tabernacles of men. Okay, Wilford continues. They have not organized bodies and are not to be seen with the sight of the eye. But there are many evil spirits amongst us, and they labor to overthrow the church and kingdom of God. Okay, uh, St. George Stake Conference, March 13, 1880. Uh, there's a stake president, uh, Snow. This is not Lorenzo Snow. This is a different uh, stake president. He said, I will lay down as a general principle the fact that Lucifer is the prince of devils and that he has millions of spirits of his wicked caste and these prey upon the children of men. Okay, stake president Snow continues. St. George uh, State Conference, 1880. We are all exposed to the influence of these evil ones until our bodies are worn out. These may derange our stomachs and bowels and flame the brain until we yield, until we yield and our bodies go down to the grave. Where does he get this kind of stuff? He gets it from Brigham Young and other uh, general authorities, right? What is the cause of stomach ailments and uh, brain ailments? Evil spirits. All right, he continues. All the sickness and affliction that comes upon mortality is the effect of evil spirits. All the sickness. The raving maniac is possessed or influenced by evil spirits, but so is the sick or diseased person. Ah, interesting, huh? All right, let's go to another story. This one can be found in the diary of Helen Mark Kimball Whitney, September 10, 1886 entry. 
Uh, Orson came at the evening and confirmed Brother Brothers and rebuked the powers of evil that have troubled him and commanded them to leave and not return. For two or more years he has been followed and tormented with evil spirits. This is like a chronic condition, right? Probably cast him out. Spirits come back, cast him out. Spirits come back. So for two or more years he's been having these troubles. Sounds like uh, something else besides evil spirits, right? All right, the diary of Helen Mark Kimball. Uh, she was actually one of the wives of Joseph Smith, a 14-year-old wife, uh, believe it or not. Uh, she's talking about possession of these evil spirits in 1886. Uh, he could see and hear them cursing and tantalizing him, tantalizing him day and night. He had great difficulties, and the evil spirits, his constant tormentors, followed him until he was rebaptized. Did the baptism uh, heal him? And confirmed a member of the church. All right, moving on to another uh, possession account. This one is from Philo Dibble, an article, uh, Recollections of the Prophet Joseph Smith in the Juvenile Juvenile Instructor, May of 1892. Juvenile Instructor was a uh, Mormon newspaper. It says, uh, so Philo Dibble says, Joseph Smith then laid his left hand upon the head of Harvey Whitlock. I guess this is a story of Joseph Smith. Harvey stepped into the middle of the room with his arms crossed, bound by the power of Satan. And his mouth was twisted unshapely. All right. Uh, Philo Dibble's account continues. Uh, Hiram Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith, arose and declared that there was an evil spirit in the room. Uh, Joseph Smith said, don't be too hasty. And Hiram sat down. Shortly, Hiram rose the second time, saying, I know my duty and I will do it. And stepping to Harvey, commanded the evil spirits to leave him. But the spirits did not obey. All right. Uh, Joseph then approached Harvey and asked him if he believed in God. Then we saw a change in Harvey. He also bore record of the opening of the heavens. All right. The story continues. Uh, next, a man by the name of Harvey Green was thrown upon his back on the floor by an unseen power, maybe a seizure. Some of the brethren wanted to administer to him by laying on of hands, but Joseph Smith forbade it. Uh, Philo Dibble pictured up here on the left. Juvenile Instructor Illustrated Magazine on the right. Uh, it is an 1892 edition, but it's in October. Uh, the one that we're reading out here is uh, from May. All right, same account here. Uh, Harvey looked to me like a man in a fit. He groaned and frothed at the mouth. Ah, symptoms of seizure, right? Finally, he got upon his knees and came out of it. All right, uh, some more information about Harvey Whitlock from another source. This is the autobiography of Levi Hancock. can be found in the L. Tom Perry Special Collections at BYU. Uh, Joseph Smith put his hands on Harvey Whitlock and ordained him to the high priesthood. He turned as black as Lyman was white. His fingers were set like claws. He went around the room and showed his hands and tried to speak. His eyes were in the shape of ovals. Uh, fingers like claws, is that a, is that a sign of uh, epilepsy or seizures? Okay, Levi Hancock autobiography. Uh, Joseph Smith bowed his head and in a short time got up and commanded Satan to leave Harvey, laying his hands upon his head at the same time. All right, uh, like quick lightning, Harvey Green fell bound and screamed like a panther. Satan was cast out of him, but immediately entered somebody else. This continued all day and the greater part of the night. 
Cast it out of one person, goes into another. Cast them out of that person, goes into another. Um, some of these screaming like panthers. All right, uh, Levi continues. We heard Harvey Whitlock say when Hiram Smith said it was not God, he disdained him in his heart, and when the devil was cast out, he was convinced that it was Satan that was in him, and he knew then it. So this is poorly worded <laughs> and poor grammar here. I also heard Harvey Green say that he could not describe the awful feeling that he experienced while in the hands of Satan. He could not describe it. All right, a little article here in the Desert Evening News, 1909, on spirit possession. An editorial in the church-owned Desert News said that there are numerous instances of possession by evil spirits. Such events, the author claimed, represented attempts by the evil one to imitate the greatest of all miracles, the miracle of incarnation or of uh, getting a body. Picture above, we have the Desert News, 1926, um, not uh, the article that we read out of, which was 1909. All right, uh, James E. Talmadge uh, said that a woman was possessed of evil spirits. This can be found in the diaries of Anthon H. Lund, an entry on February 14, 1917. James E. Talmadge is pictured above in his younger days. Uh, all right, so Anthon uh, says, We had a nasty letter from a woman. She was particularly vexed at the Apostle James E. Talmadge who says that she is possessed of evil spirits. Okay, a different entry in the diaries of Anthon H. Lund, entry on August 31st, 1917. You can see the, uh, the cover of this uh, diary. Signature Books put a bunch of diaries out, and this is one of them. Um, it says, Brother Horn and the three children came in and said they believed that their house was full of evil spirits. They had seen them. Uh, President and Prophet Joseph F. Smith got out of patience with the ideas advanced. Okay, same account here on August 31st, 1917. Sister Horn being sick, there had been someone tell them that she could not get well because the place was infested with evil spirits. Then going back to that idea that evil spirits cause sickness and disease. President Joseph F. Smith said, use your priesthood and drive them out. Drive those evil spirits out. They can have no power over a person who lives a pure life. A little, a little addition there by Joseph F. Smith. Evil spirits can't possess you if you live a pure life. But here... All the way up into 1917, the prophet of the church is still saying, uh, use your priesthood and cast out these evil spirits. All right, we're going to jump to 1941. So what, more than a 20-year jump here. There was some uh, accounts that I could, could have put in here from general conference and stuff uh, for this 20-year period of time. Um, they're not by well-known uh, general authorities, so I'm going to leave them out. Um, I could have put them in. You, you can go and search the earlier general conferences and you'll find some more. Um, but this, this uh, statement here is by the Apostle Harold B. Lee, who went on uh, to become uh, the prophet. Uh, speech in general conference, October 1949. Talking about when he came into the Council of the Twelve Apostles in 1941, uh, he was asked to administer to a young woman who was possessed of an evil spirit. In this experience, as I was challenged by the evil spirit, the hairs on my head felt as though pinpricks were in every hair. Pinpricks were in every hair and coursing down my body. So... Here we are all the way up to 1941 and a speech in 1949. Harold B. Lee still administering to a young woman 
who was possessed of an evil spirit and trying to uh, cast it out. Okay, same speech here uh, from Harold B. Lee. I knew in that experience the power of evil, and I knew again the superior power of the priesthood and the powers of the living God. All right, a story uh, from the Apostle Spencer W. Kimball about him uh, basically being attacked by evil spirits. This can be found in Edward Kimball and Andrew Kimball's book, Spencer W. Kimball, 1979. Talking about uh, an event from 1946, Spencer W. Kimball, uh, who was an apostle, awoke in his room alone. There was a strange foreboding feeling. He felt something horrible in the room. I felt almost as if I were being enveloped and taken over. All right, so Spencer remembered that his grandfather, Heber C. Kimball, had a vision of a great rush of evil spirits who foamed and gnashed their teeth. That's when Heber C. Kimball was on his mission to England in uh, 1837. I don't think I realized that Heber was uh, Spencer W. Kimball's grandfather, but now I know. Spencer W. Kimball said that time stopped. As his grandfather had, Spencer broke into a sweat. Heber said he was like just taken out, like he was just taken out of the bathtub or out of a lake. Okay, the apostle Spencer W. Kimball continues. Of course, he went on to be the prophet. It seemed that an unknown enemy was trying to destroy me. He was unseen but very real. Maybe in his spiritual mind, he saw him. I had a deep fear of the unknown. It was bleak and black and fearsome. I sweat and fought and fought and sweat. All right, Spencer continues. For the first time in my life, I invoked the power of the priesthood and relief came to me. I wondered if I was marked for destruction by the enemy of all righteousness. All right, another speech from the Apostle Harold B. Lee in General Conference entitled, That Ye May Be Able to Withstand in the Evil Day, April 9th, 1966. He says, a few years ago, so maybe around 1964, maybe longer, while touring the missions of South America, I heard President William Grant Bangader of the Brazilian Mission make some interesting, make some interesting comments. All right, Apostle Harold B. Lee continues. Uh, he reported that there had been a wave of incidents in which evil spirits were afflicting the missionaries and the, and the saints. At every conference, the missionaries were relating experiences that they were having with evil spirits. All right, Harold uh, continues this talk in General Conference, 1966. The intensity of their influence was frightening. The mission president admonished them to cease talking about the works of the devil in the future and instead teach with power the works of the Lord and bear testimony of his works among them. So maybe we can get the evil spirits to go away if we don't talk about them. <laughs> Is this the strategy? All right, Harold continues. Uh, there was an almost immediate cessation of the power of the evil spirits when the people confined their testimonies to the works of the Lord rather than of Satan. So I guess it worked. We don't talk about them. And then there was a, cessa there was a cessation of the power of the evil spirits. So if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. All right, uh, the biography of Oscar W. McConkie, I guess written by Joseph Fielding McConkie, uh, 1966 in the Church History Library. Oscar W. McConkie was actually Bruce R. McConkie's father. Uh, so in this biography, it says one story that Oscar told involved a dream in which he had gone to the home of Satan and later told of an experience when Satan had appeared to him and his son James. 
All right. Of this experience, Bruce R. McConkie's son, Joseph, related that the Lord showed James's father, who was Oscar, a vision, a vision in which he saw Lucifer and saw James turn his back on him and continue playing the piano for the Lord's purposes. All right. Uh, after the Apostle Harold B. Lee gave Oscar his opinion of what the dreams meant, he told an experience of his own. I guess Harold B. Lee is going to tell of an experience. Okay, so when Harold B. Lee was a state president, maybe around 1930, he had been summoned to the home of a member of his stake who was possessed of an evil spirit. Okay, the woman had spoken strangely to him, saying, Great physician, great physician, head of the church, you are not going to send me from this world. <laughs> Maybe suffering some, from some mental illness. Elder Lee had then cast out the evil spirit. All right. Uh, at this point, uh, Oscar W. McConkie offered Harold B. Lee his interpretation, as reported by Elder Lee, that the evil spirit in the woman had spoken of not that which now was, but of that which Satan knew I was to become. Satan gave a prophecy which turned out to be true, I guess. I guess Satan knows the future. Maybe he has a crystal ball. Years later, in 1972, Oscar's prediction was fulfilled when Harold B. Lee became the 10th president of the church. He became the, the great physician, I guess. I think that's a name for Jesus, though. Uh, and the head of the church. All right, uh, so what about uh, the Italian mission <laughs> in 1968? Well, James A. Toronto did an article in the Journal of Mormon History about reopening the Italian mission. Article came out in 2014. He's talking about events that took place in January of 1968 regarding John Dunn's Jr., who was the Italian mission president. He received an urgent telegram from the missionaries in Verona, Italy, and drove to the city to investigate. The missionaries reported that they had some rather trying experiences with evil spirits. All right. Pictured above, we have some LDS missionaries in Italy. Uh, not this same group here that we're talking about, though. All right. So here we go. Another story of missionaries uh, having trouble with evil spirits in 1968. That's uh, actually the year I was born. Uh, so the story continues. They have heard mysterious footfalls, shufflings, etc. about the chapel. Drinking glasses have been breaking seemingly on their own. Duns, the mission president, learned that one of the missionaries had commanded the evil spirits to leave after which the elders felt considerably more comfortable. All right, so a few years later, they had another event uh, happen with evil spirits, I guess with a different uh, mission president. One companionship telephoned Levitt Christensen, uh, the mission president, in January of 1970, uh, claiming to have been attacked by an evil spirit. They reported being awakened in the night with their pillows being pressed over their faces. <laughs> kind of like in Seinfeld where Jerry was teasing George by putting the, the pillow over his face as if he was going to suffocate him and kill him. They handled this alarming event by rising and saying a prayer together. And after that, they were not bothered anymore. Okay, uh... Harold B. Lee became the prophet. Uh, one of the books he wrote was called Decisions for Successful Living, which came out in 1973. In there, he talks about uh, being possessed of evil spirits. So he says, some have, seen his, some have seen his satanic majesty in his spiritual form. His satanic majesty. In bodily shape like a man. 
Some have seen individuals who have been possessed of evil spirits. Others there are who have felt the awful influence of his hellish suggestions. All right. Uh, assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, James A. Cullimore, gave a talk in General Conference in 1974. He's pictured above. He says, I bear my solemn witness that these gifts are with the church today, 1974. The sick are healed, the eyes of the blind are opened, the ears of the deaf are unstopped, the lame are made to walk, devils are cast out, devils are cast out, spirits are discerned. When's the last time you've seen, you saw one of the apostles of the Mormon church uh, heal somebody from blindness, uh, healing the deaf so they could hear, uh, healing the lame so that they can walk or cast devils out. You don't see them uh, doing this kind of stuff anymore. All right, we now have a very good account in the diaries of Leonard J. Arrington around uh, November of 1977. He's talking about M. Russell Ballard, uh, pictured above on the left in his younger days. And Ballard began by reading from Richard Evans' History of the LDS Church in England. See the cover on the right here. We already know what happened in England, right? So what is Ballard going to say uh, after this? Okay, the account continues uh, as recorded by Leonard Arrington. Uh, Ballard read the episode in which Heber C. Kimball and his colleagues experienced the devil before they began their extensive baptisms in Preston, England. We've already gone over that account in great detail. Okay, diary entry, Leonard Arrington, 1977, November. Uh, Ballard then said that this had always seemed to him like something that happened in the early church, casting out evil spirits, and was not happening in the church today. Okay, the account continues. Uh, but Ballard's experience in Toronto, Canada, had convinced him that it could happen today just as much. Evil spirits, casting them out, exorcisms, etc. Uh, Emerson Ballard was a mission president in Toronto, Canada. Um, and then while on this mission to, to Toronto, he also became a 70. So I'm not sure which one he was at the time, but at least a mission president. Uh, the more successful our missionary activities, the more opposition is presented by Satan, uh, according to Ballard. All right, Ballard continues here as recorded by Arrington. Uh, when we are contented with low baptisms and our activity is desultory, basically kind of unmotivated, Satan is not worried. But when we are making great success, the influence of Satan is present. He got these ideas uh, from those apostles in those early days, you know, they went on their mission to Preston, England in 1837. Okay, the story continues. Uh, the inference is that the presence of Satan means that we are doing very well in the mission in Toronto, Canada. Uh, Ballard had two or three experiences in which he was persuaded that Satan was present, and he related one of them in some detail. Okay, so uh, Ballard tells his story here. I guess he's giving some kind of a speech, which Arrington uh, was listening to. Um, a sister who, for particular reasons, was having some problems with the faith, was going with a group of others to the temple, uh, presumably in Washington, D.C. See picture above. All right, Ballard gets into some details. Uh, you should know that he, he is a current uh, apostle <laughs> and a president. I believe he is a president of the Quorum of the Twelve now. Um, so Ballard says, on the way to the temple, uh, this sister began to exhibit the characteristics of someone possessed by a demon. She was administered to by her husband and branch president, but the demon soon repossessed her. Maybe they didn't have a high enough authority, right? 
Okay. Uh, she was administered to again. Not long afterwards, the demon possessed her again. They stopped to have missionaries labor with her, which they did without much success. All these attempts by lower-level priesthood authorities in the church are not working. Okay. Um, they telephoned President Ballard, and his immediate thought was, here is a mental case. And he gave them some counsel. Yeah, maybe she was a mental case. Okay, they continued to labor with her, quote unquote, and administer to her, probably laying on of hands, right? Using that priesthood authority to cast out the devil. And after some time, she, she was in a position to go through the temple, which she did without any problem. Okay, afterwards, however, her trouble erupted again and again. Wasn't going away. Within a few days, it was inevitable that President Ballard must see her. Mission president here? I'm not quite sure. Okay, uh, Ballard uh, gathered up his four assistants, probably APs, right? He was training two new ones, so he had two and then uh, they were training to, I guess. And they went to her home uh, where her husband and stake president had administered to her without much success. Laying on of hands, trying to cast out this d devil, uh, not having much success. Okay, as Ballard neared the home, uh, the lady yelled out, Don't let that man in! Don't let that man in! Kind of not in her right mind, right? Uh, when he reached her, he saw a face that was contorted in such a way uh, that she was unrecognizable. Contorted face. Uh, sign of a seizure, maybe? All right. Uh, the lady spoke with a completely different voice than her regular voice. It was a deep voice. She spoke in a different manner than she had ever been known to do previous to these attacks. Um, well, the movie The Exorcist came out shortly before this account, <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to know that in that movie, uh, the little girl, I think she's like 12, was totally possessed by the devil, and she spoke in a different voice, a deep voice. So maybe some of this is permeating the consciousness of church members, uh, uh, kind of permeating the culture. All right, Ballard continues, now president of the Quorum of the Twelve. At this point, uh, mission president may be a member of the 70, and I don't know the exact date here. Um, Ballard asked the stake president to administer to her again, which he did, and they could feel Satan leave her, but Satan remained in the room. It was obvious to all of them that Satan was still present. All right. Uh, within a few minutes, uh, Satan was back in the sister's body. Uh, Brother Ballard then, for the first time, felt very certain that this was indeed Satan and not a mental problem. Well, based on what qualifications, Ballard? <laughs> Are you a psychiatrist? All right. So why was the stake president not able to use his authority to cast out this devil or this evil spirit? Well, maybe because he didn't have a high enough authority. But I thought if you raise your arm to the square and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the devil has to depart. But I guess that's not always the case, right? Um, uh, Ballard realized also that he was the ultimate church authority in the region. And that was why the stake president was not able to use his authority to banish the demon. So he's higher than a stake president, right? He's he's a mission president or a 70. All right. Uh, the details continue here in the story. Uh, Brother Ballard gave her a blessing that he says went on. He says it went on for 20 or 30 minutes. Ooh, that's a long time. Uh, kind of like the movie The Exorcist. <laughs> and so evident was it that Satan was there that he carried on a dialogue with Satan, rebuking him. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? M. Russell Ballard carrying on a conversation with Satan himself and rebuking him out of this uh, poor sister. 
And through the woman's body and her voice, he, Satan, countered with threats, with strong statements, with vile and sarcastic statements. Kind of like the movie The Exorcist. All right, but Satan was no match uh, for uh, President Ballard. Uh, Ballard kept insisting on, on the authority of the priesthood and of Jesus Christ and ultimately was able to drive out Satan not only from the body of the woman, but from the room completely. Good job, Ballard. All right. Uh, after that long blessing, maybe 30 minutes, the woman, completely exhausted, returned to her, to her normal self. Her voice returned to normal, her look and manner, her, her appearance, and so on. And she has had no reoccurrence since that time. Well, how many times did they check up on her? All right, Arrington continues his uh, description here, November 1977. Apparently, it was effective uh, because Ballard was the ultimate authority who could handle the devil. Got to go up the priesthood ranks, up the hierarchy, right? If Ballard couldn't do it, you go to Apostle, then you go uh, to the prophet of the church himself. He has even more power, right? A perfectly normal, intelligent, and rational person, Elder Ballard seems to be completely convinced that Satan is real. <laughs> Arrington's kind of insinuating here that he doesn't believe in Satan, and uh, I know a bit about Arrington. Uh, maybe he didn't, you know. He was a pretty progressive, kind of a liberal Mormon. Maybe he didn't believe in Satan. All right, so why were these evil spirits attacking uh, this poor woman? Um, Arrington says, Satan appears where there is weakness and where his influence is needed to counteract the progress of the church, counteract missionary work, I guess, and the faith where it is taking place. All right, Arrington continues here his description. Uh, since these are the last days and since the church is making such tremendous progress, Ballard thinks that Satan must be particularly active today and that we must be aware of his, of his activity and potential presence. Ballard thinks that Satan must be particularly active today. Uh, Arrington, maybe not. Okay, uh, Elder Ballard seemed to be very sincere and very serious. All right, uh, an account here from Lynn K. Packer, uh, his book, Lying for the Lord, the Paul H. Dunn Stories, 2015. Lynn is pictured here in the middle, his book covers on the right. Uh, Lynn is a nephew uh, to the Apostle Boyd K. Packer. Um, pretty good book from uh, the parts that I've read from it. So uh, this is an account in 1978. Um, some of the general authorities now are coming up with different explanations uh, for spirit possession, more medical explanations. So here in 1978, Apostle Boyd K. Packer on the left here told me, Lynn K. Packer, the story of a father who brought his daughter to uh, Boyd K. Packer's house for a blessing. Notice they both have the same middle initial, K. Boyd K. Packer, Lynn K. Packer, they both have the same middle name, interesting, uh, which is Kenneth. Uh, there must be some relative in the, the past um, named Kenneth, I would imagine. Um, so this lady was convulsing, and the father wanted an evil spirit cast out by Boyd K. Packer. Convulsing, again, typical sign of a seizure. All right, uh, so Lynn tells the story. Uh, Boyd K. Packer said the family brought along other members of the family, I guess, including the stake president. And two or three carloads came along to see the sideshow. <laughs> uh, two or three carloads expecting a show here, wanting to see the apostle Boyd K. Packer cast out this demon. All right, the account continues. Uh, Boyd K. Packer calmed the girl down, and he told her family that he would not give her a blessing, uh, that she needed medical medical attention. Wow. Around this time, 1978, maybe they were trying to cast out devils from people having seizures. Can't do it. 
go to the hospital, say, hey, yeah, <laughs> she doesn't have a devil. She's got epilepsy. She has seizures. Uh, she has schizophrenia or, or whatever it is. Um, so Boyd K. Packer would not give her a blessing. A lot of people standing around, too. A lot of pressure right, for this apostle to perform. Boyd K. Packer advised the stake president to release the father from his church job until he straightened out his daughter's problem. Get medical help, maybe. <laughs> now, get psych psychiatric help if you need to. All right, so uh, Lynn says uh, that that was sound advice, not expected from a supposed strict religious constructionist. What is a religious constructionist? I'm not sure. Uh, pictured above, we got uh, Boyd in his younger days, I guess, holding a pheasant. Maybe that's a stuffed pheasant uh, taxidermy. Um, Lynn, uh, not really that much of a believer, uh, more of a skeptic, I guess. He said that was sound advice, and it's a good thing they got the, the lady medical attention. All right, but we do have another possession story, <laughs> so it depends on what leader you're talking to here. This is a story from 1982, so four years after the Boyd K. Packer uh, story. Uh, this shows up in Jack B. Worthy's book, The Mormon Cult. A former missionary reveals the secrets of Mormon mind control, 2008. Heard about this book uh, from Lindsay uh, Corbin. Is that, is that how you say her name? Lindsay Corb Corbin or Corbin. Uh, she's also a cult expert. Um, so in 1982, an MTC branch president told a story about a missionary who suddenly sat up straight, looked the branch president square in the eye, and in a strange and powerful voice declared, This is Satan. What do you want? <laughs> a missionary who uh, was speaking for Satan here. MTC branch president. I'm not sure if this is in Provo or, or some other place. All right. Uh, the story continues in, the, in Jack B. Worthy's book. The branch president said that he immediately raised his right arm to the square and used his priesthood authority, something that we all had, uh, to cast out the demon from the missionary. Raise the right arm to the square and cast out that demon. Throughout my lifetime, I was born in 1968, I didn't really see anybody uh, in the church casting out evil spirits or devils. I did hear a story from my brother-in-law who joined a break-off group uh, from the Mormon church. And, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> active Mormons, active true-believing Mormons, believe that these break-off groups are kind of inspired by Satan. And so his dad r rose his arm to the square and uh, basically tried to cast the devil <laughs> or the evil spirits or the evil influence or whatever that was in my brother-in-law. He tried to cast uh, that out. All right. The story continues. Uh, so this branch president, MTC, addressing the evil spirit in a firm tone, he said something like this. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the holy Melchizedek priesthood vested in me, I command you to leave. All right, story continues. Uh, after a moment of sitting still, the elder slowly raised his head. He was obviously confused, and the branch president asked him if he knew what had just happened. Uh, the missionary had no clue. <laughs> he was totally out. Uh, who knows what he was suffering under? Could be, could be a seizure, I guess. Could be um, schizophrenia. Could be multiple personality disorder. I don't know. All right, so why did this elder get possessed by Satan or an evil spirit? Uh, well, it was because that he had broken several mission rules. <laughs> Talk about undue influence, right? That's something that a high-demand fundamentalist religion will tell you. It's always your fault. You know, uh, you broke some missionary rules. That's why Satan possessed you. <laughs> Pretty extreme punishment, right? So the branch president then revealed the reason why this elder had become possessed by an evil spirit, possibly even Satan himself. It was because the missionary had broken several mission rules. 
One one rule you can see in the Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's in regards to missionaries. Devil has power over the waters. <laughs> so on, on your mission, I I heard I went on a mission uh, that you're not supposed to go in the water because uh, devil has influence over the water, right? It's in the DNC somewhere. All right. So what uh, rules did he break? Well, he slept in late. Ooh, bad, huh? Uh, even worse, he, he had been listening to rock and roll music. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll make an admission. I bought a few rock and roll tapes on my mission. I was a big fan of Blue Oyster Cult and had to get their new record. <laughs> I only got a few, though. Uh, one of my missionary companions flipped out over that. Oh, well. Uh, and that was the moral of the story. It was a warning to us. Obey the rules or something like this could happen to you. Undue influence, right? Speaking for God, speaking uh, for the devil, about the devil. If you break the rules, Satan will come right into your body. All right, so what do some more modern uh, leaders have to say about casting these evil spirits out? Um, well, like I said, uh, the teachings have really changed. Like everything else in the church, uh, this is from 70 Alexander B. Morrison, General Conference, October 2005, pictured above. He says, some of the mentally ill blame their problem on demonic possession. While there is no doubt that such has occurred, maybe a long time in the past, right? Maybe even all the way back to the Bible. Uh, but I'll say, as recently as 1982, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, my brother-in-law's story, that, that was far after 1982. But anyway, uh, there is no doubt that such has occurred in the past. The mission uh, to England, right, that we went over in a lot of detail. Let us take care not to give the devil credit for everything that goes awry in the world. That's kind of what Brigham Young did. All sickness, all disease, that's the devil possessed by the devil. Generally speaking, the mentally ill do not need exorcism. They require treatment from skilled health care providers and love, care, and support from everyone else. Totally changing their tune on this, right? All right. Uh, statement here from the prophet Gordon B. Hinckley. This shows up in Truman G. Madsen's book, the Sacrament Feasting at the Lord's Table, 2008. The prophet uh, Gordon B. Hinckley said that the story of the possessed boy and the herd of swine, which we told, was designed to demonstrate the worth of a human body. The worth of a human body. Well, yeah. Uh, of course, Hinckley doesn't want to go into much detail. I think all this kind of stuff is pretty embarrassing now. I don't know, you can make up your own mind. Look at all this evidence that I've presented in a modern day context where we have modern day science and modern day medical treatments for all of these problems. Casting evil spirits out looks uh, pretty ridiculous. And that's why the church has gotten away from it, uh, you know, at least since the, the late 1970s uh, and onward, early 80s and onward not doing much of this at all. And you'll, you'll never see an apostle nowadays healing the sick. Well, maybe trying to heal the sick. Um, but you'll never see one uh, healing the blind, healing the deaf, casting out devils. They, they just don't do this anymore. All right. So let's hear from a University of Utah professor of clinical psychiatry, Louis Monch. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. Article in Sunstone, December 2006, entitled The Religion and Mental Health Matrix. So I will trust this guy <laughs> before I will trust any of the early general authorities, including Joseph Smith. I'll trust him more than Jesus Christ, who performed a bunch of ex exorcisms in the New Testament, right? So... Uh, this uh, professor of clinical psychiatry says, disassociative reactions, auto-hypnosis, overt psychosis are often misinterpreted in Mormonism as possession states to be treated by casting out demons. 
during a schizophrenic psychotic episode, searching for evil spirits to banish is futile. When such attempts fail, they demoralize the giver of the blessing and heap guilt on the suffering victim. Casting out devils has far less efficacy than antipsychotic medication. Uh, duh. <laughs> That's why we don't do much of it anymore, right? The Catholics don't do much. Mormons don't do much. Maybe there's some Pentecostal churches or somebody out there that still does this kind of stuff. Uh, if you're having a mental disorder, get on your antipsychotic medication and it will usually make a big difference. All right, so that's going to do it for this video. We went three hours, 15 minutes. Believe it or not, this was about a month worth of research and work. I was sick uh, for a few of those days, uh, but still it was a ton of work. Uh, at least over a hundred hours. I haven't really added them up uh, all the way. But that's going to do it for this video, and I thank you for watching the Mormon Exorcisms video.